And um, okay, so uh, first of all, um, although we are a little ahead of the schedule, we have with us uh, Professor Trevor Watkins, with whom we are very grateful for being here with us and to whom we want to thank the effort he's making to do this presentation entitled Aggregation and Architecture, New Norms and Institutions for a New Cultural Niche. So Trevor, if you are ready to share the screen with us. Okay. The, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, the host has disabled screen sharing. You'll have to yeah. enable screen sharing. Yep. Now. Okay, the architecture of the settlements of the Neolithic was an important and new cultural element. Through that architecture and the configuration of their settlements, we can seek to learn of the new norms of social behavior and the new social institutions that were required for life in a new cultural niche. The key word in my title, however, is aggregation, and we'll come to that rather later. We have two related and unresolved questions. The first of them is the problem of naming Neolithic settlements. I'm very unhappy with the idea that they're generally called villages. Kathleen Kenyon deliberately wrote of pre-pottery Neolithic Jericho as a kivitas, an urban settlement, a civilization, which greatly angered Robert Braidwood, the originator of the term village farming. And then James Mellart, based in Ankara, beyond the in-group of the Fertile Crescent Specialists, enjoyed throwing in a hand grenade with the idea that Chatelhuyuk was essentially urban. If those large Neolithic settlements with their elaborate and complex architecture are not urban, they're certainly not villages and we don't really have a word for it, uh, but they are very varied. The second question, what was the evolutionary advantage of living together in large numbers in permanent settlements? Why were the inhabitants of Chatal Hyuk, for example, I've been reading quite a lot about Chatal Hyuk recently, prepared to undertake the excessive and expensive rituals of everyday life there, month after month, year after year, century following century? At the practical level, how did people deal with the need for fresh water, for drinking and cooking and washing the baby's bottom? And how did they deal with the human waste of several thousand people? I'm thinking of the extensive area that must have been under cultivation to feed such a population. For many of them, the tasks of cultivation and herding would have involved extraordinary labor if their fields were several kilometers from their homes. Surely it would have been simpler and easier, not for the archeologists, but it would have been simpler and easier for them in every way if that large, dense population was dispersed in a number of much smaller settlements spread across the alluvial fan, as was indeed the case before Chatalyuk was settled, and indeed after uh, uh, Chatalyuk uh, um, East uh, uh, fell into disuse. As some of you may, oh, going the wrong way. As some of you uh, will know from what I've published in recent years, for the answer to the second question, I've been following the cultural evolutionary ideas of three leading researchers, the first of whom is Joe Henrich. From his research over two decades, he set out to show the subtitle of his book, How Culture is Driving Human Evolution, and how cultural evolution is a process whereby an interwoven complex of cultural processes reinforce each other in an irresistible dynamic. That uh, uh, last set of words, as you can see, I quoted are from the leading evolutionary biologist, Kevin Lalland, whose book, like Joe Henrich's, encapsulates the conclusions from decades of collaborative research. Henrich describes the complex process as autocatalytic, meaning that it fuels itself as a complex of interacting positive feedback loops. Lalland in particular is one of the originators of the idea of niche construction theory, and he has become mainly interested 
in the uniquely human version of cultural niche construction, whereby humans have evolved the cultural means not only to ensure populations can secure the transmission of a complex and diverse body of cultural knowledge across the generations, but also have the means to extend and expand and improve their cultural knowledge and skills. Cumulative culture in, as we saw on the previous screen, accelerating cycles of evolutionary feedback. And my third guru is the philosopher Kim Sterelny, who has written extensively on how humans have evolved their cultural skills for social learning. Since th that book of over 10 years ago, he's written a series of papers, including two uh, uh, on the evolution of religion, one of which is particularly to the Neolithic. And together, uh, he and I wrote a paper that brought together Kim's thinking with my ideas about the Epipaleolithic and Neolithic in a cultural niche construction framework. Thus, in the Neolithic, we can see people have, quote, engineered a new developmental environment that scaffolded an increasingly rich, increasingly rich, reliable and high fidelity flow of information across the generations. So I seek to understand the Epipaleolithic Neolithic as a transformational reshaping of the cultural niche that supported larger and denser populations and benefited from the secure transmission of more complex culture and the development of cultural innovations. So I was interested a short while ago when I came across some papers in leading scientific journals on the subject of urban science and settlement scaling theory. Of course, there have always been architects and social scientists, economists, geographers and philosophers investigating and discussing the extraordinary phenomenon of cities and urbanism. But information technology has only recently opened the way to big data that could be assembled from everywhere and analyzed at your desk. Settlement, going ahead of myself now. Settlement scaling theory is an important branch of the new urban science. Louise Bettencourt started academic life with a PhD in postdoc research as a theoretical physicist. Then he switched direction. And, and a few years ago, he announced a new approach in the analysis of urban societies with a short article, The Origin of Scaling in Cities, published in the journal Science. All sorts of factors that are essential elements of life in cities are shown to scale in relation to population, but not in a simple linear relationship, but scaled according to superlinear relations. For example, a settlement with a population of 10,000 is 10 times larger than one with 1,000. But settlement scaling theory might find that the population of 10,000 is 12 times more productive than the smaller settlement. Productivity is scaled at an exponent of 1.2 relative to population. In a meta-analysis of data from more than 300 US metropolitan city areas, Betancourt produces a graph that clearly shows that the scaling relationship between population and productivity. Graphing power law distributions using logarithmic transformations, I can cope with just. It produces a linear pattern whose slope is the scaling element scaling exponent, and it can be analyzed with a least square regression analysis that gives a straightforward guide to how well the data is correlated with the, uh, with the, uh, the exponent. The route towards those results, however, is, involves a lot more uh, uh, mathematics and algebra than I can readily cope with. In this table, focus on the column beta, the scaling exponent. In the middle of that column, there are several factors that simply scale in a linear fashion, so they're not outlined. More population requires more housing, of course. At the bottom of the column, there are factors for which there is an economy of scale in the modern city, for example, in the provision of services. For these, the scaling of exponent is sublinear. But in the top half of the column, there are factors that scale in a superlinear fashion, that is, where the number of patents registered per city, this is a, these are US cities which he's analyzed, or bank deposits, for example, increase at a greater rate than the simple number of the population. Lower down that first part of the column, however, there are factors such as criminality and poverty, which also increase superlinearly with scale of population. These are the cost, there are costs 
as well as benefits to urban life, but the benefits outweigh the costs. Several others have picked up on Betancourt's idea and together they have formed a research group based at the University of Colorado at Boulder. The group is called the Social Reactors Project and the phrase social reactor describes the functioning of a city. I'm sure it must in fact have come from Betancourt and his background in uh, nuclear reactors and, and theoretical physics. In this study, they first showed that the scaling properties found in contemporary US metropolitan areas apply across a variety of urban settings around the world, not just the US or the West, but from published data collected from China, from India, Brazil. And they then turned to a number of archeological examples, including for example, Pueblos in the, in the American Southwest, the Basin of Mexico, the Peruvian Andes, medieval Europe, and also ancient Greece and Roman imperial period settlements, all with the same results. Using a number of measures, and this is a quote, of socioeconomic output obtainable from the archeological record, especially public works constructions, sorry, public works, construction rates and house sizes, they find that there are the same increasing returns to scale as are found with contemporary cities. Finally, I want to mention Michael Smith's way of, of uh, discussing these ideas. He's a professor in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University, and he's worked for many years at Teotihuacan and on the Aztecs and other societies of central Mexico. He's written about comparative urbanism and much else, and I have enjoyed reading and benefit from his work for a number of years. He's been a founder member of the Social Reactors Group, but he's more archeologist than mathematician. In the lead-in chapter to a recent book titled Coming Together, Comparative Approaches to Population Aggregation and Early Urbanization, he has used the phrase energized crowding, which is he, he's borrowed from somebody else, to label the intensifying effects of aggregation and living together in large numbers. And I've used his simple diagram here, which shows the social outcomes of increased face-to-face -face interaction. Many researchers from various disciplinary backgrounds talk about scalar stress. Living close together in large numbers is stressful and the stresses increase with the scale of the lived environment. Consequently, societies need norms of behavior and structuring institutions for the community in order to counter scalar stress. But Smith argues that it is the energized crowding in urban situations that has a role in generating growth as is seen in the work of his colleagues in the Social Reactor Project. One of the advantages, let's just get this complete, oh, let's not go past it. One of the advantages that we have is the time dimension in the epipaleolithic Neolithic transformation. These urban scientists, those urban scientists experimenting with settlement scaling theory really have a time depth of statistical data that would allow them to chart the growth effects of settlement scaling. Across the epipaleolithic Neolithic transformation, we can see the pace of demographic and cultural change accelerate. There are aggregation sites in the early epipaleolithic and from the late epipaleolithic and early pot pre pottery Neolithic settlements become established that were built, rebuilt, and occupied by sedentary communities of people who live together in large numbers, generation after generation, often over many centuries. The new way of life implies new norms and institutions, the means to counter scalar stress, and the norms and institutions that framed the new social and cultural way of life were articulated in the material life of the community, whether in architecture, monumental communal buildings, imagery or rituals. The material life of the community took place in and around the buildings that they had made and which framed and gave meaning to their. There is clear evidence of increasing population densities across the range of pre-pottery Neolithic settlements and an increasing range of size of settlements. There is also evidence for cumulative culture in the increasing range of skills and activities. And it has been shown that there was an increasing range and intensity of exploitation and exchange of resources. There's a nice example of the kind of data needed in a chapter written in 2000 or published in 2014 by Harvey Whitehouse, Camilla Mazzucato, Ian Hodder, and Quentin Atkinson, whose purpose was to contextualize a, rain, a change in the mode of re religiosity at Chatelhut and its role in the evolution of social complexity, the Harvey Whitehouse theory. 
The graph shows the overall growth in the internal area of houses through almost two millennia. And the authors also note, of course, the beginnings of ceramic technology within this time and its implications for food processing and eating habits, a diversification of the already present fired clay technology, greater specialization in the production of groundstone tools in the latest levels, the increased specialization in obsidian tool making, the increase in the number and range of clay balls, clay tokens, and stamp seals in the late levels. Another paper by the Social Reactors Group looked at a group of settlements in the Peruvian Andes and how things changed as those settlements, that area was brought into the dynamic social and economic network of the Inca Empire around 1450 with the Common Era. The study of the material outputs across these settlements and across households show that the region experienced a marked economic expansion as a result of the intensification of human social connectivity and the material flows within the network. Settlement scaling theory applies within networks. And that reminded me of the important work uh, done by Juan Jose Ibanez, David Ortega and colleagues on the crescendo of distribution of central Anatolian uh, obsidian through the pre-pottery Neolithic of the Levant. Their simulations of exchange networks showed that the best fit was a small world network in which some participants accessed distant links exchanging with partners up to 180 kilometers uh, uh, from their, uh, uh, their home. For the late pre-pottery Neolithic, however, the best fit to the obsidian distribution statistics is called optimized distant link networking in which certain communities emerge as significant distribution centers and these distribution centers obtain their obsidian direct from other centers that were nearer to the Anatolian sources. In other words, the group are proposing that there came into existence in the early Neolithic complex and hierarchical systems of interaction and exchange of symbolically important materials, genes through the exchange of marriage partners and migration and the pooling of ideas, innovations and experiences. There is a particularly interesting feature of their study in their table of the percentages of obsidian within the chipstone assemblages at differently sized settlements. The volume of obsidian in the system increases with time across the pre-pottery Neolithic. But look at the differences between the representation of obsidian at the big sites in the PPNB versus the small, uh, the medium and the small sites at that period. Big sites are at least six times larger than small sites but the big sites had 33 times more obsidian than the small sites that they served and six times more even than the medium settlements. That looks to me like settlement scaling whereby productivity or wealth increases with the scale of the settlements population in accordance with the super linear exponent. So I'm concluding not with a, a, a conventional conclusion but with questions. The essential characteristic of cities is the aggregation of population and the agglomeration of complementary activities, what Michael Smith has called energized crowding. We have aggregated populations in our Neolithic settlements. Could the quantified analytical techniques of settlement scaling theory be applied to our Neolithic aggregated settlements and networks, generating developments and social change in a super linear relation to the scale of their populations? And should we see the emergence of sustainable aggregation in the Neolithic as the successful formulation of a process that continues to scale up through the Chalcolithic to the late Chalcolithic proto-urban sites like, for example, Telbrak in northern Mesopotamia and on into the Uruk period and the early dynastic and the so-called urban uh, revolution and beyond? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor, for such an stimulating and provocative talk uh, with uh, applying these new ideas of cultural evolution into the Neolithic transformation through the uh, through the architecture. So let's see if there are any questions. Remember that to avoid an extension on time, uh, questions should be made using the, the chat. However, because we start earlier, maybe we have some time to, to share the video screen with.
Okay, I see one one hand raised. Anna, Bedford Coins. Ah, your hat. No, no. I was just uploading. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> So, well, I think the idea is, is uh, I, I would be interested for two reasons, if, if this was possible. One is we can see growth, we can see change, we can see the, uh, the uh, um, almost explosion of, of uh, cultural development across the Neolithic. But settlement scaling theory uh, uh, offers the possibility of quantified analysis of that rather than simply descriptive analysis. So that's one thing, is it possible to, to think of applying the same kind of quantification uh, um, and methods uh, um, uh, and producing a quantified account of what they call super linear scaling. And the second thing is, it's, uh, I think one of the things that we do uh, rather too much is we, we focus very much in on the Neolithic uh, uh, without looking back in time enough to the Epipaleolithic, some of us, uh, and, and certainly without looking forward to the end of the Neolithic and beyond, yeah? That, there's almost a wall, yeah? Uh, between uh, uh, um, Neolithic work and you know, Chalcolithic, and, and, and then particularly when you get to uh, early Bronze Age, uh, that may not be the case so much in, in, in Israel, but uh, in general it is. And again, I think that uh, the idea, of, if we could use aggregation and settlement scaling theory within the Neolithic, it offers the opportunity to, to link our subject uh, into, the, um, into the following periods, yeah? Uh, uh, and give, play a very important role in, the, in, in, in giving the foundation for the, for the following periods. So I think we have some questions in the chat. Okay, it's Juanjo. Uh, Juanjo, yeah, if you want to say, to ask the question your, yourself. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. My question is about this uh, scalar stress. Do you think that this scalar stress reached a limit at the end of the PPMB? Can we speak of a collapse of the PPMB village model? Uh, what do you think about that question? Thank you. I think that that, that uh, uh, provides a, 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 it's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, and it's one which is not very much uh, focused on, I think, is, is uh, 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 how you get from uh, from PPMB through into pottery Neolithic and 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 to the expansion of the Neolithic. Um, again, uh, I think we've been very heavily focused on domestication and beginnings of farming, and that uh, has focused us in onto the pre-pottery Neolithic without uh, considering what what follows. Yeah, um, and clearly something quite uh, um, um, dramatic happened. Is it all across the, the all across Southwest Asia, all across the the, the Fertile Crescent and Anatolia? Um, uh, and there was a a, a a considerable change. It wasn't a population contraction because it's precisely the period in which population expands and colonization begins in in all directions. Yeah, uh, um, uh, but uh, how to how to understand what's what is happening at, at that period is is I think is 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 difficult and it. It, it's something which I don't think has been explored enough. And as far as settlement scaling theory is concerned, it would be interesting to, to put it to the, the people who have uh, uh, proposed the, this uh, theoretical approach and say, what do you think is happening when things go into reverse? Yeah, And we get a downscaling. Yeah? Um, OK, so. Next question, I see Ian has his hand. So. Thank you very much. Uh, Trevor, uh, just a quick question for you here. How were these uh, researchers doing, dealing with the issue of population aggregation versus regional growth? Because you know one of the aspects to the Near East, of course, is we, we are probably on some level dealing with both centrifugal and centripetal forces where people come together for different things, whether we think of it in terms of labor sharing or ritual practices or something else. And I've never, I've never been able to, in my mind, come up with a way of how do we really track that in terms of just 
expected growth, thinking of the entire Near East as in terms of carrying capacity, or thinking of sort of the big city lights of people coming into particular settlements for particular reasons. Do these, do these other researchers dealing with aggregation, uh, do they, have they tried to deal with that and tried to pull that apart at all? Simple answer, no. Uh, um, <laughs> the, the, only, uh, the only paper I've come across where they look outside you know, um, a collection of, of metropolitan areas uh, uh, is, uh, or uh, uh, pre-urban pre uh, uh, settlements is, is that one that I quoted from the, from the collection of a group of uh, sites in the Andes. And that really interested me because there they, they seem to be going into new territory where it's the, it's the scaling power of the network yeah, and the intensity of the network and how some sites are, are uh, in, in their case, it's the, the, the central sites of the Inca empire, which are, uh, are, are driving the economic network here. Yeah? Uh, um, uh, uh, but that's that's the only paper I've come across where they go outside. They are, it is an ur this urban science they're looking at. It's urbanism that they're concerned with, yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, when you get to the, 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 what is conventionally the pre-urban period, uh, um, then yeah, you, then we're looking at landscapes with with uh, population distributed in a landscape and how that is functioning. Yeah, I don't think that that's been done very much, but that's why I was interested in the, uh, uh, in, in the Andes uh, um, paper, which I, I, I must confess, I haven't gone to, you know, into in, in detail and followed through into the, the supplementary data, yeah, which shows you know, what it was that they're actually measuring, what, what, uh, uh, what data is actually producing that, the, their graph. Yeah? Um, uh, um, but uh, yeah, I think the, 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 the possibility is there, but it, again, this is, somewhere, an, an area where uh, I think that uh, uh, our field uh, could contribute to this, you know, theoretical approach, yeah. Uh, um, we've got fantastic data, yeah, uh, particularly for Western Asia, yeah, we've got uh, 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 better data than almost anywhere else, yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it follows through in, into uh, a proto-urban and a conventionally urban uh, uh, period, yeah. I think we've got the, and we've got the networking, uh, um, uh, uh, which is for which we have some evidence, not all that much, but some evidence. Yeah. Um, I, I would add, I, I think, um, I, I think we've done remarkably little speaking sort of Near Eastern prehistory, so we say, we don't really have a good understanding of demography and what's going on. Um, so yeah, the whole question of aggregation, dispersal, all the rest of it. Yeah, I think that's one of those key areas that we could contribute not only towards sort of our local knowledge, should we say, and temporal knowledge, but also to broader conversations about pathways to urbanism, just yeah. as you know. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we have two more questions. Uh, first, we go with uh, Joshua. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joshua, um, if you would like to do a question yourself, to ask the question yourself. Well, I can see it. I can, I yeah, can see, see it. it. So uh, says, does, does Gobekli Tepe play a similar role in providing the behavioral norms to increasingly yeah. complex communities at the onset of the PPNA? Well, it's not just Gobekli Tepe. Um, uh, the, the, um, the, there's this, the group of sites on the Euphrates, which have got very conspicuous communal buildings uh, as well. And there, of course, there's communal buildings as far south as uh, Jordan, yeah, uh, and Cyprus has got, so the early Cypriot Neolithic also uh, has a, 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 um, a one example. And we've got, was it Tel Asiab in, in, in the Zagros? So it, it does seem to be a feature of, of uh, uh, certainly the PPNA sites. Uh, that uh, um, what 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 I would um, suggest is what I what the way they make sense to me is that this is a community which is expressing itself as a community uh, uh, by the amount of labor that they put into creating and, and then uh, keeping in good order their communal uh, building and sharing resources yeah? and it shows how 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 they are uh, um, sharing cooperating uh, um, uh, and how they show each other that, that they are that they are a, a, a resilient, powerful, uh, cohesive community. Uh, um, so yes, these are these are, 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 are new norms which are, are, um, are not 
found in the same way or to anything like the same extent as you, if you go back in time, uh, um, then yes, into the Natufian, yeah, that there's, there's probably good evidence for, for uh, co uh, communal constructions. But as you go back, as you go back, it, it, it gets weaker and weaker, yeah. Um, so yes, I think these are, uh, the, these, are, uh, um, it, uh, these are norms of behavior, uh, uh, which, are uh, which are countering the scalar stress of putting 100 or 200 or several hundred people together, where previously people had lived in groups of maybe 15, 20, 25, 50 maximum. Uh, they're multiplying up, and yes, yeah, that is part of the, the scalar stress. You need new norms of, of behavior to show how well you, you cohere as a, as a group and how each of you is, is uh, playing a, a role and behaving in the, in the appropriate way. Yeah. Thank you very much for the answer. So now we go with uh, Gunesh. Hi. Mm. Oh, hi, Gunesh. Hi, Trevor. Very nice to see you. You should sure rather pay, pay the guitar for me. I'd rather. Yes, there are rather, some other. So. Rather than ask a question. Good to yeah. see you. Um, uh, it, it was very, very uh, nice talk. Thank you again. Uh, but I think we all agreed on uh, scales and population density, I think. But it it is still super unclear. So, but. Uh, we do not prefer to call uh, some small occupation and as hamlets. So when we see a couple of hundred years occupation, we of, often call them a village. Uh, so even so, some of us start to call again some Neolithic village as SDs. So I think uh, it is, this is not a question actually. Yeah, you know, I just want to say something. Mm. Thank you very much again. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Something that I think uh, we I don't really see mentioned. Uh, and Ian Ian knows more about this than I do, and Anna and Nigel will as well. That uh, um, we we know very well that settlements get larger across the Neolithic from the early PPNA through the PPNA through the PPNB till late in the PPNB. But what we don't really take so much notice of is is that the the variation the variety in scale change uh, increases over time so that yes there are big sites in the ppmb but there are also medium-sized sites and lots of small sites as well so it's it's that variety which is beginning to look produce a different uh, um a, a, a different settlement landscape yeah <clears throat> okay so there's an, another question in the chat it's mehmet somel who asks, uh, did anyone ever test whether there, there is a correlation between average size and the and, uh, average size and their occupation durations within a single period? Um, I'm not sure that I really, uh, um, I don't really understand that. Uh, that uh, explain, I mean. It, ah, yeah, of, great. <laughs> The, the, my question was whether um, across sites, uh, you, using information about their size and how long they have been continuously occupied within some period of the Neolithic, whether there, anybody tested whether there's a correlation or not. If it's um, a question, I'm sorry about that. I'm no, no, I, 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 I can't think of anybody who's, 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 uh, who's, who's done that. Uh, um, Generally, archaeologists are delighted if the site they're excavating has got a very deep stratigraphy of several meters and it gives them the opportunity to return year after year and, and build up a, a picture of, of uh, 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 long term change. Yeah? Um, but uh, I haven't seen anybody who has put together the information from different sites about uh, how long each site was uh, uh, was occupied, so far as we can tell uh, in, in, in the Neolithic. It's an interesting idea. An interesting idea. One of the things it would would begin to tell us is the long-lived sites. We'd say, okay, these are resilient communities. Yeah, maybe they are fortunate in that they live in a good place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, there's there's it's still you can live in a good place and still have problems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, the the long-lived communities would, would you could say, okay, the, these these this community is 
the, these communities with, with really long lives, yeah, they, they've uh, and change as well because they they've not just stayed the same and held things firmly together, yeah. They will have changed, yeah. So they've managed change, and and we can see today that managing change is difficult, yeah. Now we're, in our own time, we're having to manage change rather rapidly, yeah, uh, uh, and it's producing all sorts of problems. It would have produced problems uh, in the Neolithic communities too, accommodating change. Yeah? Um, uh, um, but uh, yeah, so the, 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 show us something about the resilience of communities, which is something we've not been too concerned with. Good idea. I Thank give you. all these things to, for other people to do because I'm now so old, I don't have to do these things. Yeah? I can just say, good idea, go and do it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. Okay, so is there any question left? No. Okay, so thank you very much, Trevor. Now we keep moving forward into the, the second presentation of today's session. Uh, now it's the turn of uh, Professor Bill Finlayson, uh, who in the second talk titled House and Household in the Neolithic. Uh, and we explained that, well, considering the accident will not leave us indifferent. So <laughs> Bill, please, uh, your turn, if you're ready. Yeah, just trying to share my screen and uh, play the yeah, thing. Great. Is that working? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for organizing this event and uh, uh, allowing me to speak at it. It's a bit worrying finding myself between the, Trevor's very intellectual contribution. I'm sure Ian will follow with an equally uh, interesting talk. And I'd like, before I start, just to thank all my major partners in all the research. So I'm gonna be talking about Ian himself, Ian Kite, Stephen Meithen, Cheryl McCarabitz, and, and, and recently Pascal Floor, as I try and follow Trevor's advice and move into the, the late Neolithic to see what happens next. Um, so mo mo moving on, um, what I'm going to do is, is, is try and take a step back from some of all of this uh, high theory and get, get down to, 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 to some of the basic data. So we've got, you know, as Emily says, you know, a lot of attention has been paid to the idea of the house and the village and how suitable these terms are and debate on whether hunter-gatherer huts count, count as homes or houses. Um, and I think uh, when, when we're looking at this, one of the things I think is still fairly self-evident is by the time we get to the Natufian, um, there's, there's quite a step change in what we're looking at in terms of the investment in particular places, including at Malaha, of course, what, what, what you might see as the first com large communal building. I don't want to get bogged down into the whole debate as to what in the Epipaleolithic people thought about whether they were living in homes and so on. Don't want to get bogged down that. Um, what I do want to briefly touch on is this whole Neolithic package thing that we, 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 we all, all suffer from, this trope. Of a, of a narrative of domestication, which becomes very important in the whole discussion of, of houses, uh, these very domestic units. And of course, there's been some conflation uh, of archeological remains in the social identification of house and household, as famously discussed by Levi Strauss. And Ian's used this concept uh, of social organization and very importantly of inheritance. But I think it's important to note that Ian um, his main deployment of Levi Strauss has not been in discussions of domestic architecture, but of mortuary practices, probably a much more fruitful line of evidence for this type of approach. And he also separates the house with a capital H as a social ritual economic unit from architecture by noting that a house can be composed of multiple households living in separate residential units. And a number of people have pointed out that the, the correlation between architecture and, and the, the Levi Strauss idea of the house is, is difficult to say the least. And I find for myself, it starts to be a really useful concept um, actually based on architectural settlement layout within the early Bronze Age work, such as Meredith Chesson's uh, uh, work, where she looks at the actual houses, uh, describing them as a dynamic type of material culture that people create for themselves in a series of decisions involving the availability and desirability of construction and decorative materials, where it's the materiality of living spaces that concerns her, working with multiple strands, placemaking, structured agency, embodiment, lived experience, and social memory. And I do think that these, these um, 
strands of thought get confused with the notion of house. And we need to step back a little bit from this and return, as Meredith Chesson does in the EBA, to the material evidence. Now, the call for this conference included the descriptor, the architecture of inhabited spaces during the Neolithization process, which may be a more cumbersome definition than house, but I think for myself, a better and, 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 and more helpful starting point. And I prefer such a neutral terminology than the rather comfortable of I, I, idea of house, um, the comfortable concept of people domesticating themselves and the population of the Neolithic world with quasi-modern peasants. And a lot of the time we get to this point where the house is one of these, I'm talking with a small h now, uh, hard to define concepts, but very easy to recognize because we all know what it means. It's an everyday concept uh, and we have our own cultural references for it. What a house is, what happens in the house, and that's the problem with it. It uh, brings us straight into these modern references without necessarily always thinking about what's going on. So I'm going to take a different tack, following in, 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 in the southern Levant, or particularly the south of Jordan, the work of people like Brian Bird and Ted Banning, and building on work uh, I've done at Beda with Sharon McCarabitz, uh, and picking up on the bio, bio, biographical approach, anthropological approach of Janet Carsten. So I'm more interested in the building of biographies the active use of architecture in everyday social negotiation than, than the house in, in, at present. And I am going to focus exclusively on Southern Jordan, reflecting our, our current understanding of the early Neolithic as a mosaic of interacting local traditions and developments, and my own belief that we need to understand these local histories before we can really begin to build robust synthetic accounts. Rather than think about regional evolutionary developments, I'm going to consider local contingent development, and I'm therefore very much looking forward to hearing from Juanjo Ibanez on his new work on Northern Jordan in tomorrow's sessions. Now, I used to wonder if it was my fieldwork background in this particular uh, Southern Jordanian region that gave me a particular angle on fluidity, fluidity and flexibility in architecture. And I was very pleased recently to see the work of Kevin Kay on Chattel Huyuk, where he too has started focus more on the biographic and has used a term I particularly like, space making, to describe the, the diverse sets of people, ways people work together through a common material, medium material of the house and asking how we can match in our excavations and analysis that degree of liveliness and consequence that our best understandings of the house should be uh, mean we should find. And I think that's a fair summation of much of what we try to do, except I backpedal a little bit further and say we need to start freeing ourselves of the idea of house. So I'm stepping back a bit um, from, from, from some of the discussion that, that uh, was in Trevor's paper uh, a, a, and looking at the under, underlying evidence and how we interpret it. And the communal building is obviously a vital part of that. But what we mean by communal buildings is another issue. They're not all public and, 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 and monumental like here, the Tower of Jericho. Um, now, well, I, and I've often focused on PPNA, what I think of PPNA uh, communal buildings, such as the large structure at WF16 or, or the granary at Dra, and in the middle PPNB building 37 at Beda. But I'm going to step back from that and start first here talking about smaller buildings that are present in the in these uh, settlements. So what I want to try to address today is the empirical evidence, diversity in building forms, patterns of change, and the regular construction of buildings for specific residential and non-residential purposes. Again, a different attack from Trevor. So I'm, 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 I'm keen to look, look at a sort of small data uh, angle, a, a very small data angle in some cases. And I've got a number of themes and questions that I think are worth considering and uh, up here. You know, some, some of the basic building blocks that get used in these analyses. Can we actually identify the, the family, the nuclear family? I'm interested to hear what Ian, Ian, Ian's going to talk about in his paper. Can we identify the extended family? And does that, if we can, does the extended family equate to the development of corporate entities within the community? And there's been much talk throughout uh, the last, well, I don't know when it, when it would have started, but possibly even back with Flannery in 1972, the significance of the development of rectilinear and partition buildings. What does it mean regarding social structure? Um, and what do the other, other, other perhaps smaller scale changes in buildings like the, the transition from small middle PPNB rectilinear buildings to large late PPNB rectilinear buildings is how significant is that? How do we distinguish communal buildings and what do they tell us? And perhaps in the PPNA are most of the things I think are communal quotidian while in the late PPNB perhaps they've become more ritualized. And is what I see as a decline in communal architecture from the PPNA onwards coeval with the rise 
of, of more complex um, structures and internalization of functions, um, perhaps the beginnings of, of, of the house itself. And throughout, I'm, I'm assuming that architecture has a, a very strong social role. It helps to hold communities together. And, and that, that is maybe where we see the, the changes happening over time. And I assume to a great extent that late PPNB communal building is to hold together communities that are beginning to be pulled apart by increasingly autonomous households. And perhaps that's one of the answers to what happens at the end of the PPNB, the late PPNB uh, in, in Southern Jordan with the uh, change of settlement pattern and the breakup of these previous very large sites. So starting my empirical count, uh, account, the very beginning of our Southern Jordanian PPNA picks up pretty smoothly from the Harifian and the late Natufian of the Negev. And as our chronologies have been improving, I think they're beginning to show some degrees of chronological as well as cultural overlap. Uh, very, very, very similar to, a, in appearance, the earlier structure on the left there at WS16. There is, as we move into the PPNA, perhaps evidence for increasing significance of place with more frequent returns to, to, to sites, perhaps not always permanently occupied. This is the, the earliest building at W16, and, and you can see the typical floor with a, a cup hole mortar. And then you can see the sequence of floor deposits, but these are interrupted by water lane deposits, signs of rain and so on, suggesting that it's not a, a, a permanently occupied building. Um, so, so we're not yet really looking at full-time full sedentism. As we get on into the second phase at W16, the one that we know best from our excavations, the pattern develops considerably. We start to see much more diverse architecture, frequently agglutinative, semi-subterranean, mostly elliptical, but often irregular and other, other shapes, constructed mostly in this case out of Pisa, but with, with stone used. And we've published the site plan that you can see in the, the top corner there in a number of different variations in, in, in papers. But each time we've actually worried about how misleading this site plan actually is, because it's a horizontal excavation slice across the site. And while most of the structures visible in this site plan belong to our phase two, there's no reason to assume that they're all simultaneously occupied. Uh, and it's not a single chronological slice of a contemporary uh, occupation. That said, I'm now gonna run quite rapidly through a number of examples of what I mean the sort of detail that we spend a lot of time recording in the field, but often vanishes quickly in discussion and synthesis, which I think is key to our understanding of early Neolithic lives and communities. So I'm gonna focus on a number of specific buildings um, to talk it, uh, it, it, through them in a bit more detail. This one, um, object 12, we call it, when first exposed looked like what at that stage we thought was a, gonna be a typical PPNA roughly elliptically shaped structure. But as you can see, it rapidly diverged from expectations. The structure has a, a, a deep fill, much of it culturally fairly sterile, and some of it looking like unused construction mud just dumped in to fill the space up quickly. Below this, we encounter the partition wall, dividing the structure into two, and in one half, a fairly well-preserved floor. You can see that this floor was inserted after the partition, but that sort of floor fits our general understanding of PPNA structures with its cup hole mortar set in the floor. But in this, you can also see the tops of two upright notched stones, similar to those Ian and I had reported from our granite draw, which I'll show later on. And it appears that this nice mud plaster floor and mortar were placed over an old suspended floor construction, changing the function of the structure built inside the excavated pit. But further excavation and a sondage through one full wall face revealed further complexity, both in the relationships between the structure and its neighbors, but also in its construction. This was not a simple mud-lined pit, or even a pit that had then had multiple uses. The basic construction had been modified with quite substantial changes in wall alignment and the size, oops, the size of the pit. And you can see some of that here. Moving on to one of Object 12's closest neighbors, Object 11, we can see the diversity of the constructions, very different. A close-up of the walls, shows what is probably the neatest stratigraphic sequence of occupation on the site and how it's interwoven with its neighbors. The stratigraphy is very much what we might have anticipated for every structure before we began to excavate, a series of nice domestic floors with mortars, but it's the only structure at WS16 we found with this nice little domestic record. Even here, however, the deposits were not entirely simple. At one level, we found a horizon with no floor, but composed of buzzard bones, many still articulated. 
There's generally good bird bone preservation from WX16 with this unusual dominance of raptors, especially buzzards, and it is on a migration path. But interesting butchery marks suggest that it's likely that feathers were being collected here, uh, which is, has raised all sorts of questions about what they were using the feathers for uh, uh, and possible ceremonial dresses and so on. Now, just for reference quickly, the final phase at WF16, um, the late, which is what we describe as the late PPNA, chronologically overlapping with the appearance of early PPNB settlements to the north and on the Jordanian plateau, is dominated by structures built above ground. Most of these were eroded from the top of the main part of the site, leaving mortars, superficial hearths and floors, and only one better preserved large building, or here is a cluster on a rocky knoll adjacent to the main tell. Here, there's much less sign of all these special purpose buildings. There are pretty much repeated, fairly regular circular structures uh, with only one building considerably larger. Going back to the site of Dra, we also had some set relatively simple structures. Stone walled, not built in pits this time, but by excavation to the slope of soft deposits composed of mineral material accumulating on the natural slope. And you can see the Neolithic domestic bliss represented by a mortar and cutting slab. And here's a, a reconstruction drawing by Eric Carlson. In all these PPNA sites, our putative residential structures are not necessarily numerous. And open, visible storage and food processing suggests that a sharing egalitarian ideology may have been important, more important perhaps than in the Natufian, when mortuary practices may indicate some difference in status. Freestanding stone structure continues to develop into the early, PP, early middle PPNB. And here at Shkarat Mazed, uh, a site being excavated by the University of Copenhagen, um, you can see signs of these uh, stone structures with increasing arch architectural complexity and even the emergence of two, stone, two story architectures you can see from this almost spiral staircase in one building. Now, the evolution of the middle PPNB in southern Jordan is still best shown at nearby Beda. And this selection of phase diagrams from Brian Bird's simplified beta phasing shows the architectural sequence that as far as we can determine from the 14C evidence and Christoph Bershwitz's recent lithic analysis all falls within the middle PPNB. The earlier phases, A and B, seem to show strong continuity from late PPNA developments. The final phase, C, is when a real dense spread of rectilinear two-story buildings appear. The scale of individual buildings is, however, not substantially greater than before. If we assume the bays between stone piers on the semi-basement level were largely used for storage or workspace. This is an important change, marking the end of PPNA communal functional workshop and storage space and bringing it indoors. The group of people living within individual buildings, however, may have remained as small as before, but their activities, their food storage, their consumption, and increasingly wealth became concealed, autonomous. And at the same time, buildings became more, much more standardized, perhaps in an effort to disguise the variations that were developing hidden inside. The final PPN architectural development in Southern Jordan occurs in the late PPNB. Guer 1, next to WF16, uh, is, is, is currently dated to the middle PPNB, but architecturally it appears most akin to late PPNB developments. Um, perhaps we can now see this in a, in a slightly different light. Now, now we know that the beta phase C uh, is probably middle PPNB. So I, either we can move some of these constructions back to a middle PPNB uh, prescient development, or perhaps simply a smoother flow from late middle PPNB to late PPNB. Here you can actually see stairs linking these small basement rooms with an upper floor. Construction becomes much more massive um, in the late PPNB, uh, and here's the site of Basta uh, with its uh, multi-story um, buildings uh, and, and massive masonry and the site of Baja, these sites being excavated by uh, the figure up there, hand scale gable, um, with the appearance of very large multi-room two-story structures, substantially bigger than anything that has gone before. And if we can see evidence for extended families, surely this is where that commences. So, after that whistle-stop tour of what might be the residential spaces, I want to move on to the more evidently communal architecture. Back to Fernand first with object 45, part of the cluster of objects uh, with objects 11 and 12. Here we have the benefit of one phase of use being well-preserved due to a fire, including the preservation of roof timbers and mud segments of roof and of a suspended floor. 
based on a, a, a ring of notched stone uprights surrounding a central mud plaster cell. Note that as ever at WS16, there's evidence of an earlier floor surface of a different type, suggesting a change of use of the building. Now, if we look at the detailed excavation plan, it becomes even more clear that the structure went through considerable modification, both in itself and in its relationship with the surrounding buildings. Darko Marajevic, uh, who excavated the building, uh, produced this reconstruction. And I'd point out one particular feature, the building up of the ground surface around the structure, around the outside of the structure, where soil was banked up against the walls. And it appears that as the floor level rose, to maintain a semi-subterranean semi -subterranean construction and to be able to stand up inside it, ground level was artificially raised outside the building, quite an interesting process. To continue the, to illustrate the way the settlement was constructed, here's object 56, another type of separate structure, in this case, a little bead making workshop with beads in various stage of manufacture, um, stone tools for drilling through the beads, and even a small, what, what looks almost like a little workbench uh, or anvil for, for, for placing the beads on while they're being drilled. But can we call this communal? It doesn't appear to be particularly part of any other structure. It's not a workshop inside a house, but we can't really say who used it. And then we have the more immediately recognizable communal. Here, object 75, a large complex structure with multiple tiers of benches surrounding a central area possibly a performative space with two large cup hole mortars on low platforms at its apex. Darko has again looked at the, the symmetry of this. I should mention while we're here actually, that structure 100 there is a later building and that's the largest building from the late PPNA phase, the one possible communal building from that. Uh, and it survived from the erosion on this hill uh, because it was placed within this, this earlier structure. So Darko's looked at the symmetry of the structure, the position of the, the post holes uh, and where all the internal divisions uh, lay uh, and, and has uh, suggested from that a reconstruction looking like this. And of course, the interesting thing here is by looking at the, the layout of this in this way, we get to a very different interpretation which uh, conceals the space inside rather than opens it up as a performative area. This again, of course, is WF-16. So even where this large scale investment in construction was made, it's what we see here is only a snapshot. There were fragments of upper layers and where we excavated a sondage through a poorly preserved part of the floor, we discovered another completely different configuration with different positioning of large posts and a steeply sloping plaster floor. So the site as a whole, WF-16, a relatively small site, appears very much as a set of functional spaces. Um, so here's the site, we've got areas for performance and workshops and storage and residential spaces. But more than that, those functional spaces shifted over time and not necessarily in, 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 in unison, but at various points. But you, get a, you can get a complete different configuration by comparing different layers within the buildings. Now, DRA, where Ian and I first identified the granaries with, with the suspended floors raised up on these uh, notched upright stones, is a somewhat different situation. Here we identified three distinct types of structure that appeared to repeat. The granaries, the residential structures I already mentioned, um, and here just to show you is Ian uh, Eric Carlson's reconstruction drawing of the granary, uh, but also what appear to be food preparation structures where we have what appears to be a wattle and daub wall, shelter wall um, running around uh, a plaster floor with inset uh, cup hole mortars and cutting slabs, surrounded by post holes holding up uh, a, a roof. Again, the, the Carson's reconstruction makes this quite clear. Unlike at WF16, where pit digging to some extent constrained modification of space, at draw buildings could move more easily horizontally, providing a better stratigraphic net across the site, which, which you can see here with the mud wall building for food preparation lying above, the stone uprights for a raised floor granary, which lies above the stone wall building revetted into the bank, uh, which we're interpreting as a residence. Considerable uh, fluidity in house space was used. Finally, from the PPNA uh, just now, uh, El Hammer, the site excavated by Cheryl Makarovitz and Muradi Hassa, uh, was another site with highly diverse forms of structure in the late PPNA. Uh, 
with an additional form of apparently communal structure, a mortuary building. And this is one, one corner of that uh, dense packing of, 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 of burials. Moving forward in time, and with the reminder that the late PPN A appears to flow straight into the early middle PPN B, back to Beda. Here to a small excavation conducted by Cheryl and myself of building 37 in phase A, only partially excavated by Diana Kirkbride. And that's the building uh, with the stones outlined in black. And you can see the limit of her excavation from the blue dotted line. This structure, considerably larger than any of its contemporaries, initially opened into a courtyard, you can see at the bottom of the structure. In general, it was built in a similar manner to other structures, so that although large and open, it seems to have emphasized everyday functions. But communal at a time when the increasing standardization of other buildings suggests it may have been surrounded by standardized forms of residential architecture, that standardization that we begin to see appearing in the late PPNA. The floor is very different from that found in other structures, which are relatively fragile. Here consists of a robust stone foundation with a mud surface on top suggesting higher energy activity in ordinary structures. And you can actually see that by the way the, the mud floor has worn through at times, uh, exposing the stone. The scale of the building was also important. During its lifespan, um, and you can see part of that wall there is much flimsy than the rest, the wadi edge was eroding and part of the building fell down. But a new wall was built right on the edge of the wadi edge, truncating the shape of the structure, but maximizing space. A new entrance was built to the structure in the paired wall, and this may be when the original entrance was blocked, reducing the open access and visibility into the structure, and perhaps developing this concept of privacy that seems to be going on uh, uh, with residential architecture at the time. Finally at Beda, as best we know, still in the middle PPNB is Kirkbride's sanctuary. Outside the settlement with various features suggesting a ritual context and foreshadowing the ritual buildings known from Ein Ghazal in North Jordan in the late PPNB. Unfortunately, no such clear ritual buildings are known from the southern late PPNB sites, but at most of these, the areas excavated have been relatively small compared to Ein Ghazal. However, the significance of such buildings in the PPNB has been argued to be their value as a means to integrate communities that were beginning to have internal divisions as households became more autonomous. And by the late Neolithic, that autonomy leads to a breaking up of the, uh, the hard to maintain large communities and a change in settlement pattern uh, with, with, with shrinking communities built more closely to agricultural land. And to quickly wrap up, how do these structures integrate with each other to form Neolithic communities, perhaps not as direct analogues to villages of the recent past, um, but in, the, in their own terms? And one of the features of PPN, PPN sites is that they appear to be sharply defined, uh, some in, in some cases as here, like Beda, actually provided with a wall and an entrance through steps. And when they did start to expand, they go up rather than out. And this seems in direct contrast to the late Neolithic, where at least at Dra, the settlement was much more fused and spread out with evidence for additional landscape activities, such as the spreading of mid material onto the fields rather than keeping it within the settlement. The physical integration of the community had ceased to be so important and the social and ritual integrated methods we can see in PPM, PPN architecture disappeared. So settlements were places of constant negotiation where communities reconstructed themselves and exchanged knowledge and built community level consensus that may have allowed Neolithic innovation to occur. As Kays argued, houses should not be seen as proxies for social units, but as mediums for interaction. And the house is not static in his terms. I, 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 you know, I think we'll, we'll just talk about constructions and structures and buildings here. But if we reduce the archeological archeolog evidence to a static form, we lose touch with all the dynamism of society. And his space-making approach understands the relationship between houses and people to be biographical rather than indexical. A house's nature shift contextually, fuels social drama, and accumulates a historical trajectory. So, in summary, there's a very distinctive local architectural history in southern Jordan. Almost from the start of the PPN, buildings were internally complex and contained features including partitions, benches, raised platforms, inset mortars, and molded hearths, as well as other eclectic elements unique to particular structures. Furthermore, wall configurations and internal features were typically modified throughout the use of the building. It's important to note in our building biographies that buildings change function, modified to meet changing needs, and that the archaeological evidence that we see can sometimes only show the final use 
or a hard to un unentangle palimpsest to functions over time. Change in reconfiguration of individual structures means that the settlement reconfiguration seems almost continual. Later during the middle PPMB, architecture in Southern Jordan initially maintained a circular shape, unlike other regions of the Southern Levant where domestic architecture took on a rectilinear plan, a shift that was completed in Southern Jordan only by the end of the middle PPMB. And one advantage of the circular structures is that they retain the flexibility of circular architecture fully exploited in Beda, both in domestic and in our, in, in our possible communal building of moving the entrance uh, to match social needs. PPNA communal buildings are defined by a non-residential character and appear to have played a crucial role in organizing early Neolithic societies above the nuclear family by providing a locus for routine and mundane social interactions, performing tasks and storing food resources, and occasionally for mortuary ritual. PPNA settlements suggest that individual houses, households were not an important organizing element, or indeed that there were autonomous households within a community. Communi communal architecture seems to change, initially with many functions being drawn into emerging houses in the early middle PPNB, and in late middle PPNB, non-mortuary ritual buildings appear. These communal buildings did not emerge from new social stresses arising during the PPNB, nor were they related to novel ritual practices, but rather they were already part of a temporary deep ethos of community that emerged in PPNA traditions unique to Southern Jordan, which continue early in Natufian practices. Communal architecture was commonplace and ranged in function from these highly maintained functions to the large participatory functions and, and the more visibly sacral. And that variability has continued in the middle PPNB of Southern Jordan, where for example, Shkarit Mazed, building F, contains multiple burials and a, and a, and a skull cache, apparently continuing the tradition of communal mortuary found at El Hema, while at Beda, building 37, in, in a more quotidian uh, role, um, seems to have taken on and continued the more normal um, PPNA practices of communal buildings that were non-ritual. This variability emphasized that there was more than one path to social integration during the PPN, even within this relatively small area of Southern Jordan, and that communal architecture was a crucial medium of social integration in nascent food producing structures, societies. In contrast to middle PPNB mortuary sequence practiced elsewhere in the Southern Levant, and of course, uh, at its apex, the, the plastered skulls, the everyday construction of most communal buildings and the absence of highly um, visible symbolic props suggests a fundamentally different manner of integrating the community here. The value of routine daily practices do not arise from ritual, but from the generation of habitus through the ingrained routines embedded within this architecture. The organization of the built environment draws from social, cultural, and cosmological principles. Buildings don't passively provide the spaces for everyday life, but through their construction, modification, and use, act actively um, provide a means to create and manipulate those spaces for various social purposes. As such, buildings are not a backdrop to life, but active constituents of society, framing routine behavior, social norms, memories, values, and ideologies. That's, thank you. Stop sharing. <clears throat> okay, so thank you very much Bill, for this fascinating talk and discuss about these concepts regarding the, the house and for sharing those amazing pictures too. <laughs> so um, let's see if we have some questions there in the chat. <clears throat> Well, I have a quick question. I was wondering, I don't know if you are doing uh, some analysis regarding the floor construction, but these floors that you said that are made with mud and plaster, do you know if they are only constructed using clay or do they mix with other elements of, I don't know, vegetal temper or lime or? Um, we're, we're, we're still learning more about it. And of course it, it, it's not always the same hmm. on the whole, um, and, and, and Pascal Floor will talk more about this tomorrow in, in, in some of the building experiments. Um, we know that there's a lot of vegetable matter in, in the mud used in the walls. Uh, there seems to be less in the floors, um, but, but um, they're, 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 they're still very much a, a mud plaster. The, the plaster that covers the very large uh, building at WF16 and sort of encases it, I mean, it, it, 
what, what you're dealing with at times is, is not so much a construction, but a, but a, but a plaster surface that, that's large. That's very fragile. Um, and I think it probably always was very fragile and constantly being patched up and, and, and repaired. And that seems to, you know, and the reason that's fragile, it actually has quite a lot of sand in it. So it, it, that's structurally not very strong. The, 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 the walls, the mud that they used to build the walls, they, 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 they clearly know how to make very solid walls. Some of them are, 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 are almost as hard as concrete today. They're very hard to dig through and do these little sondages that we've done. Oh, okay, thank you. So, I don't see any hands rise. Um, I've obviously not, not been as provocative ah, ever. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so, Maurice? Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Bill. It's, it's always nice to, to see all the stuff from um, our region down there again, although it's a long time I, I was there. But um, um, I, I found it always kind of striking how kind of diverse all this uh, stuff is and how somehow timely it really fits all into the MPP and B, isn't it? It's um, quite astonishing, um, especially Beda and Scout Messeyed. Um, is, is, is somehow so close to each other and then so different somehow in the development of the settlement and um, especially with the burial customs and and then I always wonder kind of um, why we might don't see the or different or changes like in Shkart Messeyed what happened there uh, in contrast to Beda uh, where obviously this nice uh, jump to the rectangular building and uh, multi-stories and so really happened and the other ones just um, stopped somewhere halfway. Um, I don't know, do we have any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why things stopped at Shkart Messeyed? I mean, I, 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 I find it, it's one of this th these things and, and, and it, it's, it's not unique to, to Southern Jordan, but we seem to have a, a sort of hyper, hyper situation of, of, of divergence between individual sites. And, and, and what, what's, what's the difference between Bader and Shkarat Mazed? It's about 10 kilometers or something. It's, it's, it's really very, very close. And uh, chronologically they, they overlap with each other. And there are some very similar architectural features. And then they seem to go off in different directions, both architecturally, but also, as I was saying, in, in ritual practice. I mean, you, building F at Shkarat Mazed has, has this uh, stone kist with many, many, many skulls in it. Uh, and, and, you know, fairly formal burial in there. Where, whereas at Beda, most of the burials from the early phase, they're just placed on the floor of one of, of, of a building that's filling up with rubbish. I mean, a completely different yeah. attitude to, towards the process. So it, it's very interesting. And I don't think we've yet... Um, really got a handle on, on, on some of this. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it's very interesting that it's, it's so diverse, but we can't just keep saying it's diverse. We, we have no. to try and work out what's actually going on. And I, I think that comes back to what Ian was saying to Trevor, is that we don't really have a hang, handle on demographic patterns. And we do know now that an awful lot is happening in a compressed period of time. <laughs> Um, and it's quite possible within that compressed period of time that, that you know, there are episodes of occupation at, at the two different sites that aren't um, parallel in time. Um, so so yeah. we, we, we may not be really talking about two different communities 10 kilometers apart, but two sites that are part of shifting patterns of, of occupation, but over very short um, periods of time. And I think that, you know, to me, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the, the next big challenges is, is to try and Get, get get to grips with actual demographic patterns, numbers, un understanding, and, and we've been looking at ways of, you know, trying to look at agent-based modeling to get at this. And of course, you know, unfortunately, by and large, so far with our experiments, we we can't access DNA data. And most of the DNA people are interested in very big questions. They're not interested in our little population studies that I think are much more fascinating than, than, know, than knowing who, who, who walked from WF-16 to Orkney. Um, Hard enough but, to get DNA out. <laughs> but, but yes, at the moment, at the moment, we're still struggling with the basics, <laughs> like getting the DNA out. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's an important question, and and I mean, I think your perspectives on these things are always very interesting with your architectural background, which I think you know is really needed as these you know in these sites as they get more and more complicated and sophisticated in, in building terms. 
it's it, they're, they're quite complicated three-dimensional jigsaws to un, unentangle. Yeah. I do think I mean one, one I mean chrono, chronology is, is also an issue that I think we're we're really only just at the almost at the beginning of in some of these places you know the, the small number of dates we have and and even if we have the potential to to, to get to the level of accuracy to, to, to un unentangle some of these um is issues um i think you know you, you you've got areas of the site that go back earlier than you're quite sure when and, and you know it'd be nice to know whether they go go whether you actually go back into the the late people in carrot mosaic and and so on and and and, and the same the same at beta and you know, ha having boldly gone back to Beda with a grant application that said we were going to sample again for more radiocarbon samples um, as the original excavations were right at the beginning of, of, the, of the radiocarbon technique. And we went back in and, you know, oh, Diana Kirkbride must have taken them all. There's not, you know, there's, 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 there's very little that's suitable for both. You know, there's lots of old, old, you know, big bits of old wood charcoal, but very little, you know, from, from where, from, you know, the small samples we were excavating, we could, we could actually date. It's, it's difficult. A lot of people find this on these sites. It's not, not just data. Okay, we have uh, one more question. Nathan Grankal, uh, would you like to ask uh, the question yourself? Hi, um, I was wondering if the utility of uh, the trough and of the, the galleys identified uh, what the Fenon were uh, identified. If there are any utility with water, anything to do with water at all or not? Thank you. No, uh, good, good, good question. And it's our fault. We called them galleys when we first found them. And, and, and the first ones we found were, were, were um, you know, ha had, had a, 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 a gully running down the middle of, of, of a raised uh, bank. Um, but after that, you know, we found ones that don't have a gully down the middle, and all of them um, appear to be sort of bow-shaped with a dip in the middle. So gu gullies was was the wrong word, but by that point, we were we were kind of stuck with gullies. We they're clearly some sort of partition markers. They they relate to the positioning of the the posts that were placed, um, not in deep post holes, but 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 on little post pads made of mud plaster. Uh, which are all halfway down the gullies, uh, and they relate to the sort of scallop-shaped edge of, of the benches. Um, but I, I, as you could see from those two options, one is you can see the central area as, as an open area that the people sitting on the, the um, benches could be viewing um, for, for performance or whatever, but for spectacle. Uh, and, and Darko's suggestion that these so-called gullies may have acted as anchors um, for, 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 you know, sort of tent dividers hanging down from, from the roof he reconstructed from the position of posts and so on. So, and, and, and that to some extent is, is, I suppose, one of the lessons for, 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 that we all know, uh, and it's always very difficult to face up to, that no matter how detailed our recording and our excavation, there's still an awful lot of things that we really don't necessarily understand. Uh, and al also it often takes the next excavation or the one after that when patterns begin to develop that you can really make sense of them um and i think you know we spent he and i spent quite a long time looking at those upright stones working out what on earth was going on to, for, to begin with and nobody ever seen upright stones like this before i think every site i've been to since has got them um and, and it's that it's that sort of thing where, where you are recognizing and identifying things as you go along and and it's it's that process that helps interpretation so at the moment those, those that's the only place we've got them so they're a bit of a one-off and hard to explain. All right, thank you. Okay, so there is one more question, but we are, I'm afraid we are running out of time. So maybe uh, we should keep moving forward. And if we have time at the end, then we come back to these questions. So thank you very much, Bill. And now uh, we move forward to the third lecture in which uh, we count on the presence of Professor Ian Quid, with his contribution titled Reimagining Neolithic Village Organization. Why are we not talking about the family that promises to be a pioneer? So Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Sharing screen has failed to start. Please try again. Hmm. Uh, let me... Yeah, you might make, make me a co-host there, I think. Mm. Okay, try again. Okay. 
Let's try that one more time. Yeah. Okay, so people can see that? Yeah, but now put it on the presentation. Yeah. Uh, there. Perfect. Okay, now people Great. can see yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much to the organizers and to everybody else. Um, just looking at the participant list, I have I continue to be amazed at one of the strange positive byproducts of COVID-19, and that is while we hate Zoom meetings, I find that it's absolutely remarkable uh, as a way of basically catching up and seeing what different people are doing. So it's just great to see all of you in, in different ways with your little postage faces about this big, right? Uh, so let me pick up on a couple of things. First of all, building on Trevor's uh, really inventive and interesting perspective on things, uh, and then really following up with some of what Bill was talking about. He in some ways made some of what I want to say very easy. I can sort of point and said what he said, because in so many different ways, yeah, I, I echo as usual a lot of the thoughts and the ideas that come out of that. In many ways, what I want to do today is think further in terms of how did spaces create social groups and how did social groups create spaces and that sort of intersection. Um, I'm, I'm very interested these days in how people are situated in buildings and how they existed, not only as individuals, but also in a, in a social context. And so to use Bill's framing of where he was talking about trying to understand further complexity along the lines of the devils in the details, I wanna do the same thing. I wanna think in terms of how do we confuse things further? And I must be candid right off that this is a work in progress. Um, this isn't entirely the paper I thought I was gonna be presenting, but I started doing research and became really interested in aspects of the family and how do we as researchers think about households but how do we potentially think in terms of families and with a little, more, a little more rigor in terms of our terminology and in terms of how we frame these different things? So that's what I wanna do is try and confuse things a little bit further and to think about some of the different pieces. Now, needless to say, when we think about the household, the Neolithic households and different forms of the Neolithic household, there's a big body of literature that's out there. There's materials that are either directly related to should we say the application of various um, terms and different forms of household. Uh, Flannery would be a good example of that. Thinking in terms of either the transition of different types of households, such as Brian Bird's work, uh, or thinking in terms of how do we think about the people who lived in these households and how did that sort of work in terms of household autonomy and sort of the transformations. Uh, Lots and lots of literature. And this, of course, is, is not even touching upon the various ethnographic research or the various research on households in other areas of the world. Interestingly enough, in my readings and coming back to things, I came back to an article that I hadn't read in a long, long time. And this is just a gem of a paper that was published by Casey Chang called The Studies of Neolithic Social Groupings, Examples from the New World published in 1958 in American Anthropologist. And this is, a, um, this is just a remarkable piece of work, given that it's basically one of the foundational scholars for thinking about villages and households in China in the Neolithic and Bronze Age, but also then turning, as he did, to trying to think about North American examples. I'm not gonna talk about the North American examples, but what I want to do is highlight some of the things that he said that are truly fascinating and in many ways made me come back to some of the things that I've been thinking about and question some of the things that I've been thinking about. One of the statements that he came with is that is a household is composed of a nuclear family, a polygamous family, or an extended family, sometimes the addiction of other adopted children, others. It's possible with care to discern the composition of a household, the tangible remains of the house. I generally agree with that. That may be slightly optimistic, but I think I agree with most of what he's saying there. What he anticipated and what, he, what I see as being really important in terms of uh, a message from, from all those years ago is first of all, 
the need to separate out the social and economic unit from, of the household from the physical remains of the building, something that is, as Bill pointed out, we struggle with at these different points. Second thing he pointed out is the need to define household social units on the basis of different organizations of the family, nuclear family, extended family. And here, I'm less and less enamored with some of the things that I've written about and thought about in some ways as creating an opposition between nuclear family and an extended family. And rather than thinking of these as some kind of dualism or opposition, thinking of these as being embedded and that we have to go back and re-engage with that. The last part that he brought up that I took heart in is really the need to think about how different types of households work, not just the processing of the labeling. And I would argue that to an extent, all of us, myself included, have spent a lot of time thinking about labeling and not as much time thinking about the nitty gritty and the parts that lay underneath that. So what can we say about that? Well, I think one of the pieces to start off with in terms of a, of a conversation is thinking about the different scales and thinking about these different levels of, um, of organization. We can think on the lower right of your screen here, we need to think in terms of a single family household where we have individuals residing in a building, maybe several buildings uh, with different rooms, but that this is largely a reproductive couple, male, female, plus children. And I just put down zero to four kids, but of course that can vary enormously. And then we can think about that, that if you build upon those, that there are extended families that involve multiple families that are connected together through either through, uh, through birth or through, through marriage or just through membership in different ways. And these would be groups of single family households that would be residing in multiple buildings. The scale of this may be 36 to 50 people. And again, those are just numbers for, to, to illustrate the scale, not anything hard and fast. So it's really thinking in terms of the compilation of five to 10 single family households. If that's the extended family or multifamily household, and in terms of kinship nomenclature, I think they're pretty well the same, if I understand correctly. If we think about that as a building block then, then we can think of what happens when we have multiple families living in a general proximity to each other. At that point, we can be thinking in terms of neighborhoods uh, and thinking about these connected together. And then we can think on some scale in terms of a Neolithic village. Now that's an idealized sketch for, for this. And of course, there's gonna be enormous variation for that. But the main thing is that we can, we can think in terms of what are the terms we're gonna use and how we're gonna define those. Here's some of the challenges though, in terms of how we use these terms. And that is, there are moments under which in the literature, we are writing in some ways in a language that doesn't fit the archeological examples. Some of this is in reference to things such as the medieval big house. We use framings that are one of the Montagues and the Capulets and they sort of the opposition of the medieval house or we do it in terms of that of an ethnographic house and borrowing from different places uh, in, in ethnographic contexts in the world. And I would argue that both the sort of that medieval framing of the big house, but also that of the ethnographic house, doesn't always really fit what we see on the ground in the Neolithic. And we have to think about those parts. There's another part to this, and that is one that we, as archeologists, we love to impose order on the past. We like to classify things and households are an extension of that, the house, the household. We like to do that. It's a simple way that's both provides us opportunity for grant money, but it's also one that, that is assistful for us as we try and organize things. But I'm not sure in the process of classification and labeling, that's really advancing conversations in ways we think it might be. So one of the things that I've been trying to do, and this is an example from 2018 that's on the lower section here, is thinking in terms of what are the various components of a house? What are the various, sorry, of a, of a household, a single family household, a multifamily household, a neighborhood? 
and really trying to think through what are some of those pieces in different, uh, different case studies. And I think that's a helpful thing, at least in my case it was, because it nudged me forward to think about different pieces. Let me just illustrate some of what I just mentioned to you and think a little bit further. This is a, an illustration that I put together uh, as a framework a number of years ago and just came back to it. But thinking in terms of the framing of the ethnographic house and really asking the question whether that language and that analog is really serving us in a good way. So for example, if we look at Pacific Northwest Coast, and if we look at work in, in Java and places like that, in terms of the scale of, of the extended house, of the house society in some cases, um, these physical buildings are very, very different than what we see in the context of the Neolithic and the Near East. We're really talking about things that are 10 times larger in scale. And yet those are the pieces of language that are sort of rolling in that language and the sort of the, the reference to it, whether it's in the modeling of things such as history houses or uh, sort of big houses and in some of my own work in terms of house societies, that there's been this sort of uncritical adoption of that language and of that framing. And as things go on, I'm, in, I'm less comfortable with some of that conversation. Here's an illustration of it. Here's a good illustration of it in some ways. If we think from Chatahoyuk at building number 52, presumably a single nuclear family there, and you can see laid out there, that's the physical footprint of what would be close to building 52 inside of a Northwest Coast longhouse. These are very different units. And yet the arguments that we have are in some ways uncritically adopting this language, this framework of the medieval house, but have yet to really think in terms of how do we operationalize this? How do we reconcile some of these very, very substantial differences? What's the footprint of, a different, ty of different types of households? That's a critical question. And it's one that we stay locked into and struggle with in some form. This is where I wanna to transition to thinking about some of the aspects of families and some of the different pieces to that. So for example, if one wants to make the argument as seen in F1, F2, et cetera, each one of those is an individual nuclear family household. And again, defined by a couple of, by a reproductive couple and some children in some form. Perhaps in an idealized way, they're all occurring together as an extended household. Now, I'm not saying they are, by the way, but this is an idealized version that one could think about. And so that there's some kind of clustering within that grouping. That framework right there has guided some critical research into directions that I think are mistaken. This is the piece of work that I'm thinking about in particular here. This is an excellent piece of work that came out by, by Marion and, and Clark Spencer Larson back in 2011 that looked at dental information from Chata. And this paper that came out looking at what they called official, um, look, looking at kinship. Sorry, not really kinship, looking at, at using dendro diagrams, looking at dentition, looking at the spatial arrangements, making the arguments that ultimately this can help us understand social organization within a Neolithic site. It's an excellent methodological study and it's important, it's focused on a really, really important topic. However, I'm increasingly un, unsatisfied with it and question parts of it. And I think that the overall interpretation misses the mark. This is one of the quotes from that. These findings suggest that Chatahoyuk may not have been kin-based society largely because membership within a house cemetery was not solely based on the basis, defined on the basis of biological affinity, such as in a group family group. This piece of work was also picked up by various national media organizations and was extended even further through various interviews. Here's two framings that came out of it. It doesn't look like there's any strong genetic component to de determining who was buried together. Further on, in a different interview, uh, Ian, Ian Hodder said, since collective life within society was important in ancient times, individually seen in Chatalhuyuk, the locals used common life, sorry, 
the locals used to share a common life and sustain a lifestyle in peace without any leader. Family relationships were not very common between. Rather than living together with family members, these people used to live together uh, other than people from within the society. Truly, they were a large family. So family is being used here as a way of explaining these things. Um, I'm not convinced about the scale here in some capacity, but the big part is that he's essentially arguing that there's something going on other than family kin-based relationships. And it's because of the fact that they couldn't see any clustering in terms of the dendro work that they did and sort of going through there. On one level, that would potentially seem to be supported by what we see with other research. Important, really great research looking at uh, genomic information. Uh, two different reports here with many of, the view, many of the participants actually in the audience right now. Good solid work that looks at the genetic affinity between individuals and asks the question what that tells us. There's also other ways we can look at this. We can think further back, and this is sort of why I'm, I'm not convinced by, by the arguments of, uh, of some of these earlier individuals from the 2011 work, and that is we could look, we can look at pieces of work based on ethnography and looking at kinship. And that tells us very quickly one of the major problems. It highlights one of the major problems by this. Here's a very simple kinship diagram. And by the way, I'm not an expert in kinship in any capacity. I have very basic training in it. But if one looks at a kinship diagram here, and you can see the grandparents, male, female, being illustrated with the triangles and the circles, uh, and you can see in terms of this sort of household genealogy, this genealogy for this group of people, one of the critical things to keep in mind is that 30%, maybe even higher of the individuals are married into this group. So there is no biological affinity between myself and my wife. It's our children that demonstrates that biological affinity. So by definition, you're already going to have somewhere between 25 and 30% of a population not being related to each other in terms of the household leadership or, or, or individuals such as the father or the mother. So that's just one of the fundamental aspects to it. So here's an illustration I did, and this is unpublished, by the way, and I just did it yesterday as a lark. So uh, please be judicious about not sharing this because I haven't gone through and double checked all the data. But this is just a really simple diagram from Hassanabad, this great work, work that Patty Jo Watson did years ago. And you can see the village down below and in the red circle, you, sorry, the red square, you can see here a square that illustrates in the close up on the right hand side some of the buildings and the buildings where people are living. These are the living rooms as opposed to storage rooms, so residential sleeping and cooking areas. What you can see here is for each of these buildings, she recorded the occupants, the household occupants there. HU is husband, then wife, then daughter. You get the picture. The ones that are in red are the individuals who are not biologically related to the husband in this family. I could have flipped it and gone the other way around in terms of the mother, but you get the idea. And as you can see from that, just looking at the red, it means that there's a lot of those people that are not related biologically to genetically, more specifically, to the husband in these families. The colors that you see, the green, the red, the blue, those are families that are biologically connected. So for example, the household, the, the uh, husband, the brother of the husband, the father, et cetera, those are the ones that are related within this group. So this shows us two things right off. One is we see a mosaic pattern in terms of the actual uh, kinship, the biological affinity played out spatially within this space. Also, we have to recognize that there's a mixture here. We're not seeing that kind of tight biological connectivity spatially as anticipated by other people. So 
let's think about this. And let's think about this a little further in terms of what are the implications for the Neolithic? What are the implications when we think of a place like uh, Shikli here? Uh, and here, I wanna thank Miraban and Gunish for their, for their access and use to, of this material. Um, but thinking in terms of, if we think of this as a village layout in some capacity, we can think in terms of nuclear families, extended family members, all represented by yellow. And this is of course, just a model. This is not representing anything in particular. But if this is the footprint of particular groups living in there, we can probably anticipate that other family members are going to be living nearby so that we have other extended families, some of which are related, some of which are not. And then of course, we have empty buildings and we have repurposed buildings. It means that we have to think in terms of this kind of a mosaic when we wanna talk about kinship and affinity within these, within these villages. So just two or three more slides here to wrap up here. So there's different pieces to this. One is that we have to recognize that with few exceptions within households, there are people that are not biologically related. And that's just part of how it works. Kinship's not just based on biology, it's created by social practices such as marriage, labor pooling, good friends, all of that. It also means in the big term that when we go back to Chata, I'm gonna make the argument that we're actually talking about a kin-based society that actually fits pretty well with this model. So here's another piece of work that again is unpublished and I need to go back and look at it, but this is taking their raw information. This is their dendro plot on the left-hand side, lower left. And then these are the two pieces of, this shows you the locations of the different samples. And all I've done here is using different colors and different shapes is to show where these, diff these different clusters at the lowest level of their analysis. What you can see is that surprisingly, they group fairly well together. If you look at the red ones, for example, they are all clustered together. The blue ones are, the green ones are with a few exceptions. The yellows are on the other side, but then some coming to the south area. So we can, we can obviously suggest that first of all, there may be some sampling issues here. There may be issues in terms of to what extent some of these are contemporaneous. There's all those kinds of questions. But the pattern that I see here, this looks to me like a kin-based family that fits very well with what we would see ethnographically. So this is not, in my mind, this is not something that's different or new. This is something that fits in terms of a family structure and being connected together. Now, there's one complication to this, of course, and that is all of us know that families don't always get along. Members of families don't always get along. And that there's always these moments under which we have labor that is shared, not in the pooling of sort of the big house like the Montague and, and the Capulets, but that we can think in terms of, even if you have a biological family, such as listed here as family one, family two, in the, the sort of the blue, their labor and their sharing of labor, they may not be going to their brothers and sisters to get help to do things. They may be pooling labor with friends, other individuals who live in other places. And this is a common practice in terms of agricultural communities. So, so that makes it problematic. It means that we have to think outside of an individual extended family when we start thinking about labor, when we think about access to resources and these, these, different, these different pieces here. It means that ultimately we have to start thinking in terms of questions that I think are even further down than that of the extended family and thinking in terms of small scale family questions. What did a family gain? For example, a nuclear family, what do they gain out of living together in close proximity from each other or to each other? We can think about that in terms of sort of the incentives and the drivers, protection from other people, uh, economic incentive with shared labor, um, the, the Neolithic big, big easy, if you want, as a phrase of the attractive big city in some form. We can also think in terms of what are the kinds of outcomes, some of which are intentional and immediate, some of which are delayed and situational. So we can think in terms of protect, 
of uh, when you have protection from people, bringing people together, that has results as well that link to health and quality of life. Uh, economic incentives can ro have roll on in terms of enhanced production, control of food, greater access to people and marriage. There's all these different pieces that we can think about, be it intentional or unintentional. When we start asking questions related to family structures in terms of that of the nuclear family and the extended family. So where does this leave us? Rather than just sort of letting it float up in the air? Well, I think it means that we need to continue to focus on certain things. We need to continue to focus on things such as hearth location and the spatial world that people lived in. This from this illustration from, from Ashikli. We need to think in terms of the location and scale of food storage structures in relation to this. Both of those are indicators of nuclear family and being able to think about those linkages. We have to think, as Bill was just talking about, Bayesian analysis of C14 dates across buildings. Essentially, how do we think in terms of what is a contemporary community versus that of something that's just going through time? And then the other part to it, which is equally frustrating, is we have to think in terms of archaeogenetics. And we have to try and better understand some of this aspect of a family and kinship through some of this, this material that's on the inside of it. What I'm saying ultimately, I'm not saying we should be ditching the household in any capacity. The household is a fundamental unit and we need to think about that. I do say, however, that we have to increasingly start thinking about how we model single family households versus multifamily households. And how are we thinking about the membership within that? We also need to think about what are the tensions between different scale households terms of mutualism, in terms of sharing of labor, and how does that track? And presumably, we have to start thinking in terms of just as you see with this illustration here, uh, and this goes back to um, a piece of work with Miguel Molis that he published of mine years and years ago, uh, thinking in terms of if we think of a household and thinking in terms of political leadership and economic leadership, where if we have these dots as individual households, single family households, as part of the red triangle of some kind of multifamily household, how do these fit together within a village and sort of the leadership that may be talking to each other, be it ritual, be it economic, they're talking to each other up above in some form and thinking about the sort of connectivity that exists between those. So finally, I guess really what I'm thinking about and really trying to suggest here is that yes, we need to talk about the categories. We need to employ categories and think about the transition from potentially nuclear family to extended families. But there's a bigger argument. These are not mutually exclusive. Nuclear families exist as part of an extended family in some form. And so that rather than just thinking in terms of the process of labeling and the identification of those, we need to think much, much further in terms of What's going on with those? What's the nuts and bolts that are helping us understand economy, shared labor, food storage? So we ultimately need to go drill down further and think about some of the grassroots elements of what is the single family household and what is the, the extended family household. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the conversations. Thanks. Well, <laughs> thank you, thank you uh, so much, Ian, for such a stimulating, innovative view and data regarding the household uh, that will give a lot to talk about. Uh, it's a lot of a lot of information to digest. So, well, uh, we are a bit late, but I think we have time for a few quick questions. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, we go first with Tobias. Well, hi, Ian. Thanks a lot. Hi, for Tobias. Your... How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thanks. <laughs> good to see you. Thanks uh, for your for your talk. Um, I was uh, I, I really appreciate that you're, you know, making things a little bit more complicated, I guess. But I, uh, I wanted to pick up and probe you a little bit on your definition 
of the nuclear family as a uh, male and female household with 2.5 children, a dog and a, a cat. Uh, so, I mean, I, I remember reading some years ago, Hugh Brody's uh, Beyond Eden, where he talks about, you know, being with uh, uh, some of the circumarctic groups in, in like your neck of the woods, Canada and so forth, where, you know, there are families that consist of uh, one husband with two wives, two wives and one husband, uh, uh, two couples co-sharing and and being polygamous and so forth but also things like you know adopted children and and so forth um which of course complicates matters even further uh in in this kind of picture that you're that you're drawing and uh so you know i was wondering whether the this kind of biological definition the pure biological definition of uh, male female and and offspring is is makes sense because it seems like it's really grounded in this kind of monotheistic westernized you know uh social organization i agree 100 percent. it's an entirely valid critique of that um there's no doubt when we look uh the other one we could mention is two sisters two brothers uh there's all kinds of different dimensions to that um uh, so I, I entirely agree with you. The challenge is how do we layer that in, that sort of that ethnographic reality, that social reality, how do we layer that in into basically the biological sharing and the modeling in such a way where we have inheritance, uh, biological inheritance occurring in some capacity? I don't know. Mm. I really don't know how we we do that. Um, and that's, a, you know, what you've just said is a background question in terms of sort of the operational assumptions and how can we, how can we feel good about the operational assumptions so that we can start thinking in terms of the analysis? Um, mm -hmm. I, I, guess my, I guess my suggestion in that case was, would be we probably assume the normative of a male-female reproductive. Um, but have to recognize that we have all these other possibilities. So, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I, I don't know what the answer is as we try and, basically as we try and explain all this new and exciting data we're getting, right? Right. I, I, I just think that also sometimes, you know, our brethren in the ancient DNA world uh, also some, you know, seem to just as, uh, operate on that assumption. I sometimes wonder, you know how far that also influences the the, the the interpretations that they make with the with the data they have right oh yes these are no disrespect to the people that are doing the lab work in some form but that's very different than the kind of social modeling of of how how societies exist in houses how people exist in houses i agree with you 100 percent. thanks Okay, so uh, I think Mehmet has another question. Hello, thank you for this uh, stimulating talk. In uh, so actually to follow up on Tobias's uh, point, in fact, the limited amount of genetic data, full genome genetic data we've uh, got from Chatelouk do support uh, something beyond the. Um, the classical nuclear or even extended biology, uh, biological family uh, type of organization, because the what the uh, in the article you uh, showed uh, figures from, uh, actually the Chatal individuals that we managed to genotype were all sub adults, uh, yeah. so we were not I we could not identify any close relationship uh, among sub adults buried within the same building. Of course, the, there is the obvious limitation that uh, these are, we, we don't know of their social relationship in, in life, right? They, they were just, they had ended up being uh, buried in the same buildings. Uh, but there does seem to be a, a, a deficiency that we're also replicating, we're supporting with new data, which we not managed to publish yet, uh, but a deficiency of related um, pairs among, uh, uh, among chattel co-burials, uh, 
Uh, and this uh, stands in contrast with a, a, a clear, um, a, a clear relatively high frequency of related pairs among uh, PPN um, burials in PPN sites like Ashiklu and Bonjuklu and now also Chayunu. So I think what uh, Marin's uh, earlier work, what, which was actually based on uh, dental uh, metrics and uh, morphology uh, and was, uh, they, they were mainly studying adults, uh, there seems to be a signal there indeed that doesn't really fit um, among co-burials, uh, that doesn't really fit uh, close biological relationships among people buried in the same building. So uh, I, I think we, we, so it kind of calls for being open-minded with respect to the, the, the uh, well, well, definitely taking your point that, you know, just um, classical monogamous couples would not necessarily be related. And uh, if everything was following nuclear families, indeed, we would expect uh, a significant proportion of pairs not being uh, closely related. But there seems to be something that goes beyond that. But with more data, definitely we'll have a much better understanding. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, and by the way, great research that you folks have been doing with that. Um, one of the things that I thought about doing yesterday when I was going through and looking at that, because I got really interested in Patty Jo Watson's work there. It, it's a beautiful piece of work that has a lot of utility. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is going back and, and looking at what kind of variation there is ethnographically within that community in terms of those physical spaces and, and learning more about that to see if that can be quantified in some capacity, which you know, is in some ways thinking about um, what would one anticipate for normal variation and then start thinking about from an ethnographic context and then start thinking about from an archeological standpoint, how would we explain similarities or differences from that? So you and I will, you and I will need to talk over beer at some point. With, uh, with pleasure, thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, we are running out of time. So thank you very much, Ian. Pleasure. And now we, we finally move forward to the last presentation of today's session. Uh, we have with us Professor Annabeth Fer Cohen and Professor Nigel Gorin Morris that will give insights into the pragmatic, symbolic, and social aspects, aspects of the use of lime plaster in the contribution title, A uh, Wider Shade of Pale, Social and Symbolic Aspects of Early Neolithic Plaster Use in the Levant. So if you are ready to share the screen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope it's visible. Yeah, we can see it. OK. One second. It's supposed to be. There we go. Um, <clears throat> Okay, great. I just want to add something that um, in terms of Tobias's um, um, remarks and stuff, there's a very interesting paper that came out in Nature last year uh, by Fowler and um, et al. Uh, on the Hazelton North Long, Long Barrow Burial in Britain, uh, which shows they've got, I think, seven different, seven or eight different generations um buried within the same long can and it's a very interesting um uh study so i'd very much recommend it anyway today um anna and i are going to be talking about uh, um <clears throat> the social aspects of early neolithic plaster use in the levant um and we're going to be a little bit more um i think um with pictures and uh, so on. So uh, maybe not everyone will be too um, too tired by the end of this evening in terms of uh, all of the philosophical stuff that we've just uh, been hearing um, previously. Anyways, here we're presenting a pragmatic social and symbolic aspects of practices associated with plaster production and use from its invention through the course of the pre-pottery Neolithic in the Levant. Uh, Plast had several uses, both as mastic, it's also useful for lighting, for hygiene, such as floor cleaning, 
above the floors and purification or putrefaction or getting rid of putrefaction from below the floors and so on. Our talk is focused on the Southern Levant with short forays to the north. And given the time limit, we shall be cherry picking illustrative examples of the above. And there are some uh, fun pictures here of the experimental lime kiln we uh, ran in um, Far Horish about uh, well over 20 years ago. Um, so first off, the uh, manufacture of, um, one second, I'm just trying to move my screen uh, um, off to the side. Um, okay, so the manufacture of gypsum and lime plasters is a skilled multi-step pyrotechnical process involving the collection of raw materials, fuel and limestone, or alabaster and gypsum. Um, the protracted heating in a kiln where for gypsum plaster, you only need temperatures for 150 to 200 uh, uh, centigrade. While for <clears throat> producing large quantities of lime plaster, you need temperatures of 800 to 900 degrees centigrade and prolonged firing. Uh, in addition, you need the slaking of the quick lime in water to form the hydroxide. And note the quick lime uh, is highly caustic and toxic, as we found out uh, in the process of making our experimental kiln. And if you don't have bucket, plastic buckets or plastic gloves and so on, um, it's really can be quite painful. Um, and then it needs to be mixed with additives such as ash, crushed chalk, etc., as temper. And then it can be applied and shaped as a paste. Uh, and it often has a slip coat or burnishing to finish it off in terms of its use. Okay, so in general terms, mass production of lime plaster is much more complicated um, to make than that of gypsum plaster to, due to the longer duration of firing uh, several days and much higher temperatures required with the addition of fuel. Lime plaster is more resilient and resistant to moisture than gypsum plaster. If we look at a rough map um, of, the, of the Greater Levant, uh, we can see that... Uh, Nigel, it doesn't move. It doesn't move? No. What does it move? No. I'm afraid that we don't see the pictures. You don't see the pictures? No. Uh, Just... Resume share. Okay. Now, uh, now, now. now you... Okay. Could you, could you see it before? Uh, okay. Some of you. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, perfect. Okay. Is, is it visible now? Yeah. Okay. Um, apparently, the use of uh, plaster during the PPMB expanded and was widespread throughout the entire Mediterranean. So, um, as Mellart pointed out many years ago. Um, but if we're looking at the beginnings um, or the use of lime plaster, firstly, uh, you can see that lime plaster is primarily uh, common. In the, in the south. Uh, I know it's also common uh, in some areas up along the Euphrates and so forth, but gypsum uh, lime plaster appears more common um, in the nor more northerly areas uh, than the lime. Um, so I hope, is this visible? No, you are stuck in the same picture. I'm stuck in the same picture. Here no, I'm on the map. Oh, I have to resume share every time. OK. OK, so we can see that the beginnings of, of the use of uh, lime plaster uh, occurs um, during the Middle Epipaleolithic. Uh, from the geometric Kabaran about 18,500 to 15,000 Cal BP, uh, from the sites of 
Lanjima North 8 um, in Northern Sinai, which we excavated years ago uh, with Offer by Yosef. Um, but it also occurs, uh, I've got another example here from a site that I excavated in the Western Negev, Shunra 12. Um, is this visible? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so this is um, this another site in the same um, area of the Shunra dunes. Uh, this is Shunra 7, which is um, terminal Ramonian, late Epipaleolithic, equivalent to the early uh, Natufian. Um, um, a small encampment with a series of hearths, which you can see over on the right in the um, distribution map of uh, lithic debitage. And from one of the hearths here, we, uh, we found this lump of lime plaster, which was analyzed by um, Yuval Goren many years ago. Uh, it probably weighs uh, five or six grams, something like this. Um, and this seems to be the sort of quantities that were being initially produced uh, back at the time. Um, in terms of architecture, um, architecture first appears with the uh, late Epipaleolithic, the early Natufian um, <clears throat> Habitation One. Uh, excavated by uh, Jean Perrault many years ago um, um, from the early Natufian. Um, <clears throat> this seems to be the first time that we're encountering real architecture, um, architectural features um, made using the line, which was also investigated um, um, by Kingery and so on. The important thing to note here is that although Perot originally identified Habitation 1 as a domestic structure, it seems to be quite unusual, quite unique, uh, not only in Enan, but also uh, compared to other sites. And of course, the use of a plaster bench together with some monoliths, which you can see across here, if you see my pointer, the green, slabs, uh, together with burials and so forth. Um, in certain respects, I think uh, um, maybe a precursor of some of the uh, benches that we see later on, even in the PPNA and PPNB, um, including uh, Wadi Fainan and so on. Um, another, another site if you can, if the slides are still moving forward, um, is from uh, is from the early Natufian Hyanim cave, where the series of structures here are special structures. They're not domestic structures. Um, the domestic structures were apparently outside on the uh, terrace, uh, parts of which were excavated by Don Henry. Um, as opposed to the excavations within the cave, which were conducted by Biosef and Anna. Um, and especially the special floors here with the uh, slabs, uh, many of which are incised with very delicate um, uh, markings. The lime kiln that was discovered here was actually above the floor within the fill filling up the structure. Um, another uh, Natufian site, late Natufian from the Negev Highlands, is the site of uh, Saflu Lim, near the aggregation site of um, um, Rosh Khorsha, uh, from excavations that I conducted back in the 1980s. Um, and here you can see some uh, evidence for some sort of a lime plaster surface. Uh, the test excavations here were too limited to really define the shape of the structure here, but it's definitely a, uh, an extensive uh, lime plastered surface 
or floor or something like this. And you can see here also the lunate with the uh, lime plaster um, mastic still uh, adhering to it. And then when we reach the final Natufian, we have the site of Nuffalin Gev 2 up uh, by the Sea of Galilee, um, which has been excavated in recent years by Lior Grossman. And off on one side of the site, um, adjacent and above the wadi, there's this uh, very interesting um, semicircular structure um, built in against the, the, the Wadi Terrace, um, uh, together with a whole series of burials uh, actually encased within the plaster. Um, all of these uh, pits contain burials, and you can see one of the burials here with the very high quality lime plaster um, encasing the burial itself. Interestingly, when we get to the PPMA, we don't seem to have very many, uh, very much in the way of, um, of lime plaster. It seems to be mostly, um, um, mostly mud plaster of one sort or another within either these semi, uh, these oval semi-subterranean structures, some of which have uh, stone uh, foundations, others of which are simply made of mud brick. Um, <clears throat> there's another example here from Ian's excavations at Iraq at Dub uh, with a raised platform and one of these uh, bedrock uh, cup marks uh, laid down within it. And again, from uh, Nativa Gdud, where there doesn't seem to be evidence for these uh, larger scale silos that we saw previously in Dra, um, but made out of uh, sort of Mali, uh, probably Lisan material um, uh, to form the silos. And then of course, uh, we're back to uh, Wadi Finan 16, uh, the excavations of Bill and uh, Steve Mython. Uh, <clears throat> again, with the idea of this bench, certainly this seems to be a, a, some sort of a communal structure. I, I personally have a feeling that maybe the site is actually a, um, um, an aggregation site and is not a regular residential site, but that's a different story. Um, by the time we reach the early pre-pottery Neolithic B, we find again the use of uh, the lime plaster in quantity. And here we have um, <clears throat> uh, a structure excavated by Hamoudi Khalili at Motsa, early uh, PPMB Motsa, where there's both this semicircular structure and this uh, more rectangular structure alongside it, where you can see the plaster curving up uh, the wall of uh, the partition between the two halves of the structure. You can see that it's been highly burnished. Um, and here it's worth mentioning that when we're getting into real its application for um, um, for architectural purposes on a large scale, each ton of lime plaster requires about 1.8 tons of limestone and two tons of wood. And if we're using the open pit firing method, you probably need about twice the quantity of fuel. So I mean, this is uh, labor intensive. Uh, before the temper is added, the ash sand or crushed chalk and so forth. Uh, if we go up to the middle Euphrates, we have the site, of course, of uh, Jade, excavated by uh, um, Eric Coquignot, 
and from Miguel Molis excavations at Halula, uh, the appearance of colorful patterns uh, in the case of Jade, the early PPMB, or the middle PPMB, there's basically what one can term as, as some sort of floor painting of what appears to be uh, women uh, dancing uh, has been the, uh, the interpretation here. Uh, okay, in, in the case of the Halula structure, from what I can understand, it seems to be of more of a residential structure as opposed to Jardi, which is uh, more along the lines of one of the Kiva type uh, communal structures. When we move southwards again uh, to Gary Rolfson's excavations at Ain Rosal, uh, we can see the huge quantities of plaster uh, in the bulldozer sections here uh, in the top. Um, also, this structure uh, cut right down the middle by the bulldozer, uh, but you can see the quality of the plaster here. Sometimes the floors are painted red, uh, as with this sort of daubed uh, situation here, or with lines, uh, panels along the base of the walls. Uh, and again, here you can see it uh, uh, curving up the wall itself. Another interesting burial, um, uh, sorry, uh, house with lime plaster, if I go back, uh, is one of the houses in, uh, in Rizal, where there's a whole series of burials were placed within this uh, structure. Um, and then after the burials had been put in, they were basically plugged um, using the lime plaster um, to, to patch over the floors again. Um, a very nice example here from Juan's uh, excavations uh, at uh, Hari Sin, uh, where you can see again the highly burnished surface of the lime plaster uh, together with um, a molded hearth within, uh, within the plaster itself. Uh, somewhat similar examples occur both on the, also on the west of uh, uh, the Rift Valley. Um, here at Yiftachel, both from the excavations down below by um, uh, Yossi Garfinkel and um, uh, from the excavations of Yanir and um, uh, Hamoudi Khalili. Um, interestingly, from the excavations of uh, uh, Yossi Garfinkel, there seemed to be from the, uh, the plans of the site what appeared to be adjacent lime kilns. Uh, it's sometimes rather difficult uh, to actually identify the lime kilns, but from our experience uh, with the experimental kiln and so on, it's really worthwhile having the kilns in very close proximity to where they're going to be used. Um, Bill mentioned the site of Beda, where the communal structure, um, rectangular structure over here, which underwent several different uh, reuses uh, with uh, a very finely burnished plaster surface. Um, but the, in addition to the plaster surface within this special structure, it's interesting to note that in the uh, corridor houses, which you can see over here, some of the examples, uh, from Kirkbride's excavations, the remains of the iron plaster floor, sorry, previous, uh, uh, not only on the floor of the basement levels, but you can also see the remains of plaster on the buttresses 
for the floor, um, the, the, the upper story floor. An interesting site is the site of uh, Nesho Ramne, uh, which was published just recently um, by Mika Ullman. Uh, it's basically an only PPMB site. This is the entire uh, size of the site, probably less than 12 meters square. On the top, on the surface, there's later occupations of Calcolithic and, and uh, um, <clears throat> later periods, but absolutely no evidence for material other than uh, early PPNB within this karstic uh, shaft, um, which, which is natural, but it has a series of uh, small line kilns. There's no architecture there, but there are some very interesting finds, both um, human remains, formal remains, and, and shells and other uh, remains and so on. But, but with evidence for several small kilns. Um, when we move to uh, Kfar Horish, um, we have this massive early PPMB uh, 1604 podium, which measures uh, 22 meters by uh, 11 meters. Uh, it has three successive uh, plaster floors. Um, and also, subsequent to that, um, there's a whole series of other lime plastered architectural features, uh, which I believe were mostly cappings for what was happening be, uh, below the lime plaster. Um, so we had the Locus 105 here, uh, burial pit, which was exposed within the mechanically dug trench one here um, with an entire uh, herd of uh, oryx buried together with a young male individual here. Um, uh, and here we have other examples of the lime plastered surfaces from the later phases, the end of the middle PPMB, beginning of the late uh, uh, PPMB with a series of lime plastered uh, floored structures under which we had Locus 103 here, which is a multiple burial uh, in a single pit here. Uh, this is the remains of the lime plaster up here um, with, I think it was uh, 14 individuals uh, buried within this single pit. Um, recently, um, Abby Gofra and um, Anna Erich and, and um, have excavated the site of uh, Nakhul Yarmut 38, where there seems to be what Abby uh, describes as a series of uh, rectangular mortuary structures. He doesn't believe, from what I understand, um, that there are <clears throat> that these were used domestically, um, but they have a series of uh, burials within these pits uh, dug within the, the structures. And the entire site seems to include, I think it's about five or six of these um, um, rectangular structures, mortuary structures. So. The next, um, there's a special structure um, in uh, middle PPMB, Shakar and Masyad, um, that Moritz and company have been excavating. And this special mortuary structure has a, a series of cysts uh, with human material within them. And from what I understand here, because we're not in a limestone rich area. Uh, the plaster here, if I'm not mistaken, is more of a mud plaster rather than um, rather than um, 
uh, lime plaster proper. Uh, moving back to uh, the late PPMB in Ain Rosal, there are the two special uh, circular structures, really quite small, um, where again you have burnished lime plaster going up the walls uh, and also around the floors with the central pit was apparently a hearth um, together with ducts for air to encourage, um, encourage the combustion within the hearths themselves. So it's possible these could be seen as something rather similar to um, North American sweat lodges. Um, even, even in Southern Sinai, where it's all uh, metamorphic rock um, and granites and so forth, um, there's these interesting um, figure of eight structures at the site of Udrat el Mechid, um, excavated back in the late 70s uh, with offer by Yosef, um, with again some sort of locally available um, whitish plaster, but again, not lime plaster. Uh, and these cysts here contain burials, and it seems that they were pri previously used as some sort of silos. And then, of course, one has the statuary during the middle um, middle and late PPMB, uh, uh, such as that in Ain Rizal, uh, with the cordage uh, around the wooden skeleton um, for these uh, statues and figurines, uh, which occur not only in Ain Rizal, but also in middle PPMB Jericho, they have very interesting, apart from the um, hair details um, added to this Jer on this Jericho um, <clears throat> statue, it's interesting that they have, they're very narrow in profile, as you can see here from the Jericho example. And of course, we need to take into account that there were, uh, in Nakhul Khimar, there was the hat the that was discovered so maybe these were um were dressed uh in addition uh to having the white plaster which again seems to be quite symbolic um in terms of their use um we have from the excavations of cheryl um, Sean Makarovic, um, the, city, the special structure that uh, Bill showed previously from PPNA El Chema, with a series of sitting burials. You can see the, the burials here, um, including the mud plug or plaster, mud plaster plug uh, covering one of these burials very, very similar in terms of the approach uh, that we see from areas much, much further to the north, uh, such as that in Halula, with this uh, illustration by Eric Carlson from uh, Ian's, uh, Ian's work, um, with, with, again, sitting burials. Um, Here's the example of this, one of these structures in Ain Rizal, where it has a sort of Swiss cheese-like appearance. And from Tel Khalula, from Miguel Molis's excavations, the sort of front patio area within the structure that was not covered in plaster, but had the series of holes for the burials within, which sort of ties in, in certain respects, 
some of the northern sites with some of the southern sites. And of course, even in the um, final PPMB Baja, we have um, this fascinating um, burial in, uh, in Locus 408 that was recently published um, by Marion Benson Company um, of a, an individual buried on his side. Uh, the whole thing covered with um, uh, grave goods, a mace, mace head here, a dagger, a bone spatula, a pestle, and so forth. And then the final phase of closing the grave itself is this thin layer of plaster that was applied on the top across here. I'm also including here the uh, composite bracelet that the individual was wearing on his arm, uh, because this also is made of some sort of uh, Mali-like material. Um, in terms of burials, um, we have an interesting case from the excavations by Bill and um, Steve in uh, uh, Wadi Finan 16, with the use of some sort of gypsum impregnated basketry or map. I was fortunate enough to visit the site exactly when they uh, discovered this um, incredible uh, find. And of course, more recently, from the excavations of Cortic Tepe, right up on the Euphrates, um, there's several burials which are encased in uh, gypsum. This one over here is just a single um, burial. This one over here includes two individuals together with the grave goods. And you can see some of the mace heads and other items here. And a similar phenomenon uh, was described by uh, Andrew Moore um, from the middle and late PPMB of uh, Abu Herrera uh, of um, a fairly young uh, juvenile individual also encased within gypsum plaster. And then, of course, we have all of the uh, plastered skulls, whether from Ain Rizal, Yiftachil, Besamun, Jericho, and so on. Uh, they all appear to share the same uh, general approach in terms of the plastering, which appears only on the facial areas up to the ears. Um, uh, although the details in terms of the finish of the um, um, of, of the faces um, varies from site to site, but one can get an idea here of how complicated it was. Both the examples here from uh, Aswad, uh, excavated by uh, Daniel Stordur, and the ones from Ramad. Um, excavated much earlier by de Cantonson. Um, and interestingly, with these sort of plaster or mud uh, uh, stands, on, which are really quite minute relative to the size of the uh, actual skulls of the individuals involved, um, it's interesting, Carl Horish, that we have at least four uh, very four um, plastered skulls. Uh, and this material over on the right here may actually represent part of a plaster stand, something similar to what we see over here from Ramad. Uh, I should also add that one of the plastered skulls uh, was colored the pigment here is from cinnabar coming from uh, the southern uh, Taurus. Um, and then, of course, finally, we also have more mundane objects, the plaster beads, both from uh, PPMA Gesha, as well as from middle uh, PPMB Nakhul So to wrap it up, 
Um, plaster production can be viewed as one of a series of epipaleolithic pyrotechnical innovations. The chemical modification of, uh, together with the chemical modification of ochre, fired clay, and pottery, and whiteware, and so on. Plaster was first introduced for mundane use as a mastic for composite tools. And interestingly, the next step of plaster use entailed the wrapping up of burials, almost inserting human bodies into plaster envelopes into the ground, similar to the insertion of microliths into a haft. In the Natufian, plaster surfaces were confined to special structures, yet by the early Neolithic, and most obviously during the PPMB, the uses and quantities of plaster expanded to include also domestic purposes, such as floors and walls. The efforts that in the efforts uh, and, and investment produced literally tons of plaster. So much so that the purported ecological denudation of the region during the later PPMB was attributed to the growth of plaster production involving great amounts of wood burning. While um, uh, Gary Rollison's um, uh, suggestion was not always accepted at the time, I have no doubt at all that there was, uh, it had a major ecological effect. Um, it's also at that time the plaster use continued and flourished within ceremonial funerary symbolic contexts as structures, statues, plastered skulls, as well as continuity in its use in more ordinary settings from hafting to jewelry. Thank you. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Nigel okay. and, and, and Anna for, for such an interesting talk <clears throat> with this amazing overview of the use of plaster. Uh, it is amazing what some materials can tell us about the past. Mm -hmm. So, okay, uh, we are a bit out of time, but uh, we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we have two questions in the chat, and then, okay, Yanir has his hand raised. So, uh, okay, I think Trevor asked first, so he, he says, um, remind me please how much time and labor is involved in producing lime plaster. I guess that is easy to lay, but how expensive is the, <clears throat> is the manufacturing process? Uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, I wrote that before, if I can. Yeah, it's already I, answered, I wrote right? That before, before Nigel talked about it and gave us the figures, it was hugely expensive to produce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, we can go. I don't know if who was first, but Janir, uh, you can. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Nigel and Anna. Uh, I, I want to ask you um, because in the last time we excavated with Lena Brailovsky, also at what appears a PPNC um, house with a mud plaster in the area in the foothills, the Judean foothills, the Shpela, which is an area with the limestone. So what do you think could be the, the, the uh, utilization of mud plaster instead of lime plaster? Uh, Anna, do you want to answer? I can't get back into, uh, I don't know why my, Video is stopped. I can't see anything. Anna? We, we see you. Uh, okay. Honestly, Neil, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I can't uh, uh, respond why they choose the mud ladder rather than limestone. A, maybe it's uh, an issue of. Um, costly expenditure. I mean, mud plaster is much easier to produce and you don't need all the 
you have seen the figures. We, we ourselves were amazed by the time we collected all the data, how expensive it is. And if you think about how much of that plaster was used in sites like if the hell, and you know it from personal experience or all this, it's amazing. So we suppose that it, uh, the only answer I can give is that it was much cheaper. And you can see that they were aware of the cost because um, sometimes you can see that the plaster is of high quality and very invested. And sometimes you can see that it's really cheap. And uh, like uh, the site of uh, Farah Horesh, you can see places where the plaster was used like uh, on the podium and it was really of high quality. While in other places it served, as Nigel said, more like a barrier, you know, like separation, a thin veneer of separation between burials or between the up and the down. And the people on the spot knew about quality and they simply made their own calculation of costliness. Hmm. Okay, so the last question, uh, it's in the chat. Uh, it's Hassan who asks, how much do you think the choice of raw material, lime, gypsum, etc., was conditioned by cost, access, utility versus social reasons? Well, I, I think I would just, I mean, Yanir and me just discuss this yeah. issue, I mean, about the, the price, how much you can pay. I mean, there was a, a time that actually, uh, I, th I think it was the idea of Yosti Garfunke who said that maybe we can differ between uh, houses of the rich and the houses of the poor by the quality of the plaster and the various houses. Uh, at first, it looked like a very ingenious idea. Uh, later, of course, like everything else, things became much more complicated because you could see that sometimes it's a very thick plaster and a lot of uh, effort was invested into it, but the quality was quite bad. It's like, you know, a novo rich maybe. So <laughs> you can speculate a lot about it. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Nigel and Anna. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank uh, you for staying for such a long time with us. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, so thank you to everyone. Uh, now, after when we finish this session, in a few minutes, we will send to all of you the link for tomorrow's session that uh, will begin with the Southern Levant region. So we hope to see you all there. <laughs> I don't know if Anna, si vols dir alguna cosa? No, just, uh, just to note that, um, that a lot of ideas <laughs> appear now and maybe uh, tomorrow trying to put each one in each uh, region will be um, also interesting at church or will be useful for all of us. Thank you so much for, for being here to join us in this, in, this, in this session. Thank you guys. And see you tomorrow. Have a nice day. See you and I hope there will be time to all of bye bye. <laughs> and thanks again. It was a pleasure. Bye. Thanks so much to hear all of you. Bye. Jo tinc el, la pantalla fosca, no, no, no se'n veu. I quan apreto la, la càmera em diu que no d'això, que, no, que l'operador me l'ha cerrado. Oh, però se't sent, eh? Ai, merda, ara li tot sent. Ah, Miquel, se't sentia, eh? Si volies dir res. Bueno, demà més. Ara. Hola. Ah, oh, se cola, un pato bien gras. Yeah.
no son tiempos que no son tiempos de res. Sí, sí, sí. Quedan encara bien personas online. Vale, vale. Es que no me veía el jersey. Encara bien aquí. Yo no me veía el jersey. Hola, guapa. Un abrazo. Bueno, ha sido un ha sido un éxito, ¿no? Yo creo que sí. Encara bien personas conectadas. Ella es inconectada y se está grabando, yo.